Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and welcome to the next episode of The Hard Compound Live. Uh, for those of you who don't know, um, um, uh, my name is Rich, and I run and operate The Hard Compound. We're a one-stop shop for all things motorsport, um, ranging from F1 to touring cars, NASCAR, IndyCar, bikes, and everything uh, in between, roundabout, um, and everything else. Um, when we get the time, we do these in the form of uh, race reviews, race previews, car unveils bike unveils new liveries all that kind of a thing uh throwbacks birthdays breaking news and all that good stuff and this is all done on our facebook twitter and instagram uh pages if you search for the hard compound on any of those three give us a follow uh you'll find us um we put out uh, two three posts today um and we also do live interviews such as this these go out on facebook twitter and youtube so do head over to youtube uh give us uh uh, give us a search, find us, and give us a follow. All the videos are in the live section. So uh, we've had some fantastic guests on um, from across the motorsport spectrum, um, from um, uh, various kinds of motorsports, past and present. Um, just to give you a lowdown of just just a few, we had the honour and the privilege of speaking with Mr. Mario Andretti and with Jackie X. We've spoken with Mr. Terry Fullerton, great rival of Ayrton Senna back in the karting days. Uh, we've uh, spoken with the likes of... Um, 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 Mark's, uh, excuse me, Mark Sura, uh, Mr. Nico Prost. We've spoken with um, uh, Derek Warwick, Stephanie Hansen, uh, David Brabham, Eddie Cheever, Emmanuel Pero, Carl Wendlinger. Um, we spoke with Willie T. Ribs. We've spoken with Danny Sullivan, uh, Alan Zer Jr., Lynn St. James, Jason Plato. Um, we spoke with Fabrizio Giovanardi just last week, um, Frank Sittner, uh, Ivan Muller, Rob Gravitt um steve soper many 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 others um so uh, do go and uh, watch those on the facebook channel and on the youtube channel um as and when you get a chance but do not go just yet because we have got another terrific guest for you this evening someone i've been wishing to speak to for a very very long time um and i bumped into him at the autosport show recently so we've managed to pull this together so i'm out of breath now um, without any further ado, uh, please join me in extending a very, very warm welcome to uh, a former F1 racer, BTCC racer, sports car racer, and one of the bravest racers out there, one of the biggest fighters we've ever seen. Um, please join me in extending a very warm welcome to Mr. Martin Donnelly. Richard, thank you very much for your invite. I'd like to meet this guy. He sounds very impressive. <laughs> 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 yeah 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 um yeah we uh, tried to get him but we had to uh, get you instead no i'm joking of course i'm of course joking um martin how's things thanks at the moment richard life is good uh busy obviously for anybody in motorsport anybody in the world you know during our pandemic one and whatnot the circuits were all closed and the circuits are closed our livelihoods as being a driver coaches and testing and racing all comes to an end so you know, you've got to find other ways of trying to make a livelihood and keep busy. And, you know, I work these days for Polestar. I'm actually here in one of our lovely purple hotels during you know, this live stream. Um, and, you know, as I said, it, it pays the money and it pays the bills. And, you know, next week I'll be doing something different. Again, I work very much with Lotus Cars. They're very much part of my family uh, uh, with the LDA, Lotus Driver Academy. And, you know, every week, every day in my life, I'm very fortuitous to say, is different. So there's no boredom. There's no, you know, one day is the same as the other. It's, it's very much not so. So that way in my life, uh, I can't complain. No, fantastic. And 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 that's good. I mean, it, it's a good thing to have, you know, some some diversity in life. You don't want to get stuck into um, any kind of boring grind, which it doesn't feel like your life at any point has ever been that, um, which is a wonderful thing, even through uh, those those tough times with COVID and everything that we spoke about that was so difficult for everyone, but particularly to guys like you who weren't able to work as much or at all. Um, but um, it's great that you've uh, agreed to come on, have a chat. It's great to see you again. Obviously, I've mentioned we bumped into you at the Autosport Show, which was great. Um, so thank you very much for coming on and doing this. Uh, I appreciate it. This is all mine. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to turn my attention to the comments section. Loads of comments coming in already. Uh, Nick Hunt, Oliver Taylor, Rob Keeves, uh, Chris McMahon, who else you got? Elton McManus. Hello, hello. Uh, Dawn Jacobs, Thomas Day, many, many others. Thank you so much for your comments already. If you have any questions for uh, Martin that we can work in or any memories or 
any 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 comments like that we will do our best to work them in but um yeah we've got a lot to get through um because it's been a heck of a ride hasn't it martin so um um if i may you can start right at the start um where did your um interest in um cars motorsport racing etc uh, come from well you're not gonna believe me if i tell you this story but it was the day i was born my father was a very hard uh, working man he had hands like as hard as camel's feet um worked for the funny business where they were fruit, fruit and vegetable wholesalers around the city and he had the usual run to deliver to shops and schools and um, back in the day we're going back to like 1964 my mother went to hospital and the family rang the various routes that my father was going to go on to not to say forget the work and come straight away but when you finish work come to the hospital and that's what happened he was uh he arrived there after visiting ours uh had finished and he came into the ward up to my mother's bed and i was in this like a cut moses thing beside the bed and he asked my mother what was a child because back in those days you didn't know if you were going to be male female or not or neutral gender for <laughs> yeah. and uh, my mother said well pick the child up and pull back the muslin and that's what he did he picked the mus picked me up and pulled back the muslin and in my fist was a red shark nose Ferrari. And that obviously told him it was a boy. And uh, just let's say uh, a couple of years ago, that shark nose Ferrari was on my 50th birthday cake. It was a, it was a toy that I was never allowed to play with as a, as a boy, like around the, the, the cupboard of the house. That was put in my dad's sock drawer. I was told never to get out and play with it. And that will end up being, let's say, a, a family heirloom. So that's your question. The day I was born. Because my wow. father was a keen motorsport enthusiast. He came from a family of 10, good Catholic family. And um, what behind us where we lived was a circuit called Dundrod, where they ran the Osser TT. So the likes of your Rob Angel Fanjo, your Sterling Moss, God rest his wife who died uh, yesterday. He's dead, yeah. Sad news. Um, Mike Hawthorne, all those great drivers. My dad used to take his car up, park it a couple of fields back, walk across the fields to what was the Herpin then, and just, that was free spectating, and just watch these heroes of the day wow. drive these van walls and, uh, you know, great cars at speed on public roads. And wow. Where he got the the bug, let's put it that way. Nobody else in the family had it, just my father. So then he bought himself. I'm, I'm not surprised. <laughs> fancy road cars like Sunbeam Rapiers. For the, those of you that are old enough to remember them, a Lewis Cortina 1600A, a Hellman Imp, all sorts. And then he worked on a Saturday morning, and then finished work by at half ten o'clock, drive like bejesus down the Arts Peninsula, get the cursing. Put some competition on those cars, uh, tank tape up the headlights. So if you hit a car, the glass wouldn't smash on the tarmac. No roll cages, a cheap helmet, and off you go and go do some racing. Wow. Uh, that's where it all started from, way back in the day. That's a proper introduction to racing, isn't it? A yeah. real sort of just turn up, tape characters. up, and go. Great characters who all at the same time raced their road cars, and whatnot. And then it was like, in the marquee, it was a, uh, was a part-time marquee because they had cows in the feet, so they watched where you walk for the cow pads. And rah, 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 drink. While he was doing that, I would take his road car around the circuit and just do laps and laps and laps. Me and a guy called um, Al McGarry, who's still very much involved in the racing, and his cousin, Kevin McGarry. Um, and then I'd be in the car, up the road, and they'd all race themselves between these two like stone flint brick walls to a town called Kirkcubbin to a pub called The Mermaid, which has its own private snug at the back. There's another hour or two in there. Then back into the race, carry on after they're pissed up up to a place called Grey Abbey to a place called The Wildfowler, where more drink was, was to be had and food. And my dad actually got The Wildfowler to sponsor me, not financially, but just to buy my dad and his friends free food on a Saturday night when they come from Kirkson, you know. And those, wow. are just, those are just great weekends for my dad. He got away from the pressure of work, 
We were staying at somebody's house on a, Friday, on a Saturday night, and they get home on Wednesday, sometime Sunday. <laughs> Eventually, sometime Sunday. <laughs> Love that. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, it is. Could you imagine people going racing like that now at you know, the top end of things? Oh, Amazing. Um, <laughs> I love that. Then wasn't a big issue as it is today, but and no insurance, but you couldn't do what they were doing in these days. No, absolutely not. Um, so, I mean, when did, I mean, obviously you have memories of all that going on. And um, when did you first think, I'd like to have a go at this? Um, I'm guessing your dad didn't take much persuading. <laughs> It was, all, it was all his his plan. There was no, never ever an actual business model. My dad bought a, an old Crossley 16F in 1976, I think it was, uh, for a guy to race, a guy called Dewey Greedon. Um, and the idea was that Dewey then would become, would learn the mechanics of the car by tyres, about the engines, about gear ratios, because every circuit you go to, you've got to change the gear ratios to suit fast circuits, uh, slow circuits. So that when Joey would learn that, tech, the mechanical side of it, so when I turn of age, Joey then would become my mechanic. And of course, you know, maybe when they went testing, I got the chance to drive this car and they put some coats behind my back and some cushions and pushed me forward onto the pedals so I could drive this car. Wow. Now that was 1966 and I was... 12, right? So I was born in 64. So 12 year old, we did laps, laps, and laps. And then I remember one time the local dentist, Joey's dentist, my father's dentist, um, a guy called Macaulay. Uh, he was, he fancied himself as a bit of a rally driver. And they brought him out of Kirkson because they wanted him to buy the car. He said, Look, come down to Kirkson. And they fussed him. They got like open pit lane, no set schedule, do as many laps as you like. And I was getting every as the, the day went on, he was getting quicker and quicker. And then, of course, at the end of the right young buck, he says, We'll give you your 10, 12 laps. So I then came the coats and cushions, and off I went. And I went about three seconds quicker at 12 than this so called rally driver. And of course, that cost them the seat of the car. He said, If I can't go out there and be the 12 year old, he says, What's the point of me buying this car, you know? <laughs> um, so then, wow, brilliant. Then I got into my teenage years. And my father wanted to form this best friend, like my dad would be my best friend, he would be my best friend. There was none of this father, son. And I never allowed to call my father by his, his by like dad at the race weekends, because in case he's talking to some female girls in the marquee, you know. Uh, <laughs> and he bought across the 32F, a four-year-old car. And I think he spent about something like four or five thousand pounds on it. Um, we had a friend in UTV back then called Jerry Kelly. And uh, we did a feature down at Kirkson. And I remember the link, it was Jerry looking away from up the track behind him, where I was going to appear from. He said, Most young kids these days ask Santa Claus for a scholastic set or a couple of toy cars, but meow comes past Martin Donnelly. But Martin Donnelly got the real thing, you know, at sixteen. Oh, brilliant. And uh, that yeah. was the start of uh, my racing career, you know. Wow, that's amazing. Because never ever thought about going to England. Never ever thought about something. It was just riding a wave. It was a bit of a weekend scrack with the lads, with the boys, and return back to your studies or your work on Monday morning. <laughs> just purely a fun thing, just yeah. as a hobby. And it's more excuse my dad or to a way to justify get away from the mother for the weekend. I have a bit of fun with his, with, with, his, with his mates, you know. And then we got a guy that was my mechanic, a guy called Ronnie McWhorter. And I'm going to say happy anniversary, Ronnie. He turns 60, 60 years of, of wedding anniversary this weekend coming. Um, and he became my mechanic, uh, very much from the other side of the division. Pleasant, they lived in Donald. I was in West Belfast. And then his daughter, Diane, Got involved in motorsports. sports, she liked me, which I didn't realize she didn't come to racing while I looked after other drivers. But when I arrived in the scene, she um came on because she fancied me. Well, I mean, Happy she's, days. Only, she's only she's only human, and, of course. Uh, I mean, you can't blame her, can you? Oh, but on to me, I didn't realize at the time. And <laughs> you know, we did hill climbs, we did sprints, we did circle racing. And the more often you're behind the steering wheel, 
it's just seat time as we call it you know like a stupid player doesn't need to practice three four five hours a day because he can't hit the balls it's practice 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 and in motorsport and like track day stuff the more often you're behind the steering wheel the more you refine your skills and the quicker and faster you go so and and it was again that was another side of it getting that track time to yeah. improve and to but bear in mind the time i was at boarding school then because where we lived in west belfast it wasn't a very nice um part of the world a lot of uh sectarianism we had that time, had yeah. ira snipers fully dressed and camouflaged come across the playing field and and shuffle underneath the porter cabin that was built on breeze blocks and we were under the desk with a head in our hands while we could hear him get himself organized underneath and he wasn't a fuss any army patrol any police patrol mostly in vehicles like he passed to go pop 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 and then run off into the house to stay behind us and get uh, get refuge and of course the police normally couldn't return far because the border cabins were made of balsa wood and oh. they were being used as uh, human camouflage so rightfully my parents thought well, we can't have our son grew up in this uh, ambience and they sent me off down south to the Republic to the first town called Dundalk and I went there mm. for seven years as a as a boarder. Wow. Uh, this, this whole special dispensation from the school principal on race begins to go out and go racing so I had to stay first study from five until seven and then I could leave after that miss the second study throw my bag over the school wall climb the wall jump on the wall my dad would be there with his Volvo and a car and a trailer. We drive off down to Mandelo, test on Mon test on Saturday, race Sunday. I drive them back home because they're full of scoots. Stop off in um, the dog Azzy's for a fish and chip supper. Drive to the college, bag over the wall, and a good friend called Brian McLean, who used to leave the art room window open on the ground floor, big dumbbell windows in. So I climb into the window, lock it, up the stairs, in the dormitory, Bear in mind, this dormitory had 60 boys in it. It was a big old school. And into my bed, and then half past six in the morning, people went to this bell, get dressed, and away to class. And that's what I did the last uh, two years of my life at boarding school, special dispensation. That is incredible. Yeah. I love that. I, I just love the bit about, about, about the bag over the wall and off you go. Yeah. Amazing. I had to take your school books with you to pretend to do some study on Saturday just to keep the mother happy. <laughs> yeah, sure. It's <laughs> just to keep everyone on side. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's incredible. I love that. Um, so, how did you get from? I mean, because I've done a bit of research on this, and it was a chap like Frank Nolan who, uh, who took you uh, over to the UK. How did you get from hopping over <laughs> the wall at a boarding school to coming over to the mainland, the UK, um, to go racing in Formula Ford? Was it? For 2000, yeah. 2000. Uh, mainly because the first year with that old Crosley, I was against guys like Paul Bishop and Pat Duffy in modern day cars, quicker cars. I was beating them. So that got uh, the attention. So I was full of driver of the year in Northern Ireland and driver of the year in Southern Ireland. So that got the impression of people in England. So Rolf Farmer, who's now still a very good friend of mine, who ran Senna in from Ford when he came to the UK in 81. He gave a loan of a chassis, a year old chassis for 82, and uh, scholar engines, Alan Wardropper, came me into. So we had a new, uh, a year old car and engines for free. So that left us more money in the key to do a bit more testing. I won the Irish Front Foot Festival, and Frank was sponsoring a guy back then called uh, PJ Fallon, who had approached Frank for sponsorship. Uh, but Frank had then realised that PJ was a married man uh, and wasn't able to sort of commit to going to England because of, of the family situation from at the time at the time. Sure. Yeah, the time so there. Frank then uh, agreed to sponsor me in nineteen eighty three in the Irish Championship and any of the races that didn't clash with the English championship, we would have crossed to to do it. Now we bought an old Vauxhall Luton removals van back then and we got a paint of orange and blue which were Frank's colours. Uh, so we took this pikey van across the UK, um, Belfast, Liverpool boat, went to the circuits, and we were able to take, we had works teams then, works Van Diemen, works Reynolds, works Argo cars, 
with all good drivers that all went to various successes uh, in world sports. Mauricio Gould got the F1, Julian Bailey got the F1, some guys sports cars like Andy Wallace, Anthony Reid. So there's a good there's a good ten ten guys are all top notch. And I was yeah. able to take it to them and win a couple of races. In fact, there's a meeting at Dog the Park was a, a British championship round and a European championship round. And I finished first in the British and second in the European. And that wow. got me the recognition then of the English teams. And uh, behind closed doors, um, between I think Frank and Ronnie, a deal was done with uh, Van Diemen. And by this time, I just started university with the Queen's University to do mechanical engineering. And I did a deal with the, the university principal that um, if my career in England didn't take off, as I presumed it wouldn't do, uh, that I could come back and pick up where I left off. And he said, fine, Martin, he's a great opportunity, you shouldn't waste it, and we'll hold a place open, to, open for you for uh, a year. And I moved to Norfolk in January 1984. I still live there to this day. I never had to come back again. It was very fortuitous that not like a lot of American or European drivers or even Australian drivers, they had to move all around the continent, around the world, to go to various teams and and and, and uh, Vormulus. And I yeah. was able to stay put. So, you know, it was a blessing from above. Almost sort of like fell on your feet there when you know, and in in terms of relocation, uh, which is I mean, you just mentioned that Anthony Reid there. He lives just up the road from me here. Um, yes, because uh, uh, he's just up in Oxford. He's not far from where you are now. Um, I and mean, he came uh, on. He's a, a governor for the members meeting at the Goodwood. Yeah, he's a house captain, isn't he? He's one house of the. Captain. Yeah, yeah I mean, he to use. I mean, he came on for a chat um, last year. Um, just what a lovely guy. What a lovely yeah. chap, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. He does, not he? <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> yes. I mean, I mean, so, I mean, you've come in, you've won the races and you've gone, you know, excuse me, uh, you've had the success with, you know, in the in the British and the, and the European, things like that. Um, I've got something here. Was it at Brands Hatch? Uh, where are we? Yeah, there we are. Yeah, was it? Um, you had the was it the BBC Grandstand yeah. Trophy at Brands Hatch? I saw some footage of that during the week, and yeah. you were ahead of what was it Anthony Reid and was it Mark Blundell? Mark Blundell and Anthony, yeah. Blundell, Gillian Bailey. Yeah, you know, and you were. Oh, they're away. all ranks together. The thing was that Frank wrote me a quite a stern letter before the the Grandstand. So we joined Van Diemen eighty four, and the car wasn't. The most, it was just an old shed. It just wasn't clicking. In fact, uh, Mauricio Guzman uh, was the other works driver and he left the team and, went, and, and bought a Reinhardt chassis and won the European Championship that year. Mauricio Sala won the British one in Reinhardt's. So I left the Van Diemen team and joined Russian Green Racing. Again, he ran Senna in FF 2000. And Frank was there saying, if we couldn't win uh, an amateur type BBC Grandstand series, and then was the point in him carrying on back of me. No pressure there then, was there? You know what I mean? <laughs> so, uh, it's it like a win or it's over type thing. <laughs> I had to win at all costs. And if you watch the right race, you'll see that uh, I think it was the last race of the year. I went to pass a back marker. And as I came to his left, he came left. And I hit him. And my whole nose cone and, and uh, wings got stuck onto the car. So I had no aerodynamic downforce. Oh, and then God. I hit a curve to get rid of because he rubbed against the tyre. And then I held off Wallace and Rick Morris for a while with no front wings in the car. And that made me BBC, BBC Grandstand champion. And wow. that impressed Frank impressed, impressed quite a lot of people. And then again, like, you know, the British press, the motorsport press, and the specialists and teams all wanted a piece of Martin Dunn because Martin Dunn was a winner. So we then progressed into British Formula 3. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, would, I had no, no plan... If you ever ask me, would I do race in England? Would I ever race in British from the three, which was like up there at the time was Martin Brundle and uh, Ayrton Senna with the big wigs then? Or would I do F2000 like F2 or F1? I'd just say, you know, what are you smoking these days? You just wake up and smell coffee. Never, <laughs> yeah, ever. It's not going to happen. Yeah. But with a bit of success, 
and you're beating the legs of Damon Hill and these guys have got good names, you're watching TV, you think there must be something there. So all of a sudden you start to get into training, you start to knuckle down and start to knock some doors and take things professionally. And right place, right time, right people, right success on track, the door's open for you. And I lost my drive at Swallow. Then I went to Glen Waters at Selnet. Rico team, he gave me a one-off deal. Got my first party at Thruxton. Next race was Zanfort. And we finished one, two, eight. Damon won our second. So me arriving there, gave Damon the kind of backside that he needed. And then at the end, the end of 87, I won my car. So eventually, when you win my car, you become F3 world champion. So again, F1 came knocking with Benetton through Peter Collins. Right. And right. so and so it just things just progress just, out of your control. I mean the the time that I remember, I mean, we had a quick discussion about, you know, before we came on air about when I first discovered you and racing and everything. It was like when I was like six, seven years old, it was watching Formula Three and it was you and Damon <clears throat> in the Cellnet Rico um team. I think it was around at Snetterton. Um I think it was Snetterton, and I remember you and Damon were going at it. <laughs> and songs um and i think damon had a spin at the bomb hole and he bumped into the bar and i can remember murray walker on the commentary saying oh and who's that oh and it's hell oh damon this is not your day <laughs> and with that you went whizzing past didn't you? <laughs> that's one of my earliest motorsport memories i'll tell you a story about myself the damon script Damon's one of my dear friends i just one time we have a rat pack do every year we go to lion yeah and we all we don't talk more sport, we talk about uh, other things. And during I think it was don't quote me, you have to look at the record books, 87, 88, selling that at their own race event at Knockhill in Scotland. Oh yeah. Not a championship, but big prize money. So that was the draw for the team to go and do it. So, because if your drive drivers did well, you could make good money or keep your costs and make profit. So they sent Damon up the week before. Or the week off, I should say, because obviously the Hill Hame, Graham Hill, and uh, Graham Hill and Damon Hill, you know, it was good for the for the TV, good for national press, good for the radio and, and newspapers. And then I went up there on the, I think Wednesday for testing Thursday, whatever it was, and uh, that all went according to plan. Of course, then all my friends came across from Lawrence to Norris. We had a lot of Irish support there as well. And this is the middle of July, so I mean. The place was packed, you know. Wow. The press, obviously, it was live on BBC TV with a guy called Dickie Donnelly at the time. I very, remember him, yeah. <laughs> very broad Scottish accent. Yeah. Uh, um, so the clock of the course at the time, I remember qualifying, and I would go quickest, they would go quickest. I told my engineer, a guy called Paul Jackson, to swap my tyres from side to side, because not kill was a clockwise circuit. So your your right hand side tires don't really do any work. Right, it's all loading on there. So I went said swap my tires side to side. This is about last seven minutes of qualifying. Did that, went out, got the the left tires working proper again. I went quickest. Right? Check a flag. I thought, yeah, great. Official times came out and they gave Damon Paul, right? I went, no, 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 no. So I looked at the timekeepers office and said, look, can you please just check your sheets because my team and Quite a few others have got me as being pulled. And it took a long time and they said, no, nope, we've got Damon's pull. Okay, I smell a, smell a um, fire play here. So in the yeah. meantime, I've got the other team's sheets. I got my engineer's clipboard and his book and Damon's engineer, a guy called Benz. I said to the consumers, thank you. Here's eight individual sheets. I've all got me as being quickest. And I said, my car, same car, I'm Black, uh, black um, orange we have it was black we wouldn't change it so I I was well upset then not surprised so word got out the next day I could have Damon off the first quarter right live on TV so extraordinary drivers briefing they say we're going to start you guys in F3 side by side uh, one by one not side by side so excuse me so other guys in the lower junior formulas and for 40,000 and 1600 can start side by side but let's experience why do we have to start uh one by one like modern day grand prix oh well, martin it's been brought to our attention that you and david could have a bit of an issue the first corner we're just trying to avoid that 
So, knuckle the pole was on the wrong side. So I thought if I can, and hot, if I can get David against the inside line, where all the marbles are and all the dirt, that maybe his tires will pick up some dirt and filth, mm. and maybe I could, could pass him. So I'll get back to the grid. All the marshals jump onto the pits, uh, the, the grid, and push all the cars side by side. So there's a waving at, at me, trying to get the starboard starter's attention. The lights come on, and I go put my knife, pull sharp right, and pin David in against the white line. And we're doing a bit of wheel banging. We get down the double step, the camera angle changes the head on head on uh, height. I have locked my front brakes. David's locked his, but of course, Keith's got all the dirt and filth in his tires, got less grip. Right. Shot across my body, on the grass, into the tire barrier. I carried on, red flag. Anyway, restart, went on at the canter, won the race, new lap record. Took me out of the car, quicker morning, could you hammer off, kid off, Dougie was talking to you, hammer off. Bill Martin, that's a great result for the team. I said, Dougie, he said, look, I said, the hospitality you've had this week, be made to feel very welcome. Look, all the grandstands and the car parks are full. It says, great testament to a great circuit and the organisers. Thank you, BBC, for covering this. And I said, obviously, Dean had some sort of brake issue with his car. He locked his brakes, but I simply got the result, right? A few drinks on the Sunday night. Went home on the Monday. Tuesday morning, fax through. Remember faxes? There were no emails back in those days. Yeah, no, yeah. Well, I was on my fax machines. Fax machine said, I had to attend the Senate offices on the Thursday at half past 10 to explain um, my unprofessional behaviour, right? So, off you go down there. Yeah. Got the offices. There's Stephen outside already. Inside were the three main bosses. We were brought in individually. That could be like the headmaster's office. Brought in individually to explain our course of actions. They then brought us in together and said, look, we know we have the best team. We know we have the best engine. We thought we had the best drivers. Quite clearly, your behaviour was unsportsmanlike the weekend and you're both being relieved of your drives. Now, bear in mind, I was 19. I had a new mortgage for my new house. I was getting paid by selling to drive, good money. We got paid a thousand pounds a win, 500 pounds for a second. Free mobile phones, because all the Japanese and American drivers bought my phone for free. And free road cars. Life was good. So all of a sudden, I've got no income. In F3, so, wow. so, yeah. so what do you do? Anyway, long story short, three weeks later, another fax came through. Let that be a lesson to you both. Your drivers have been re um reprieved and uh there's no iron team. So it didn't have to become world champion in two thousand and six, I think. No, the British just, press yeah, was, think, yeah. You were his team, what was you like? I said, Oh, I said Dave that I got sacked at Knockhill. So being instead of being back page news, it was front page news, which obviously wasn't a test at the time. I thought wow. him can still laugh at about these days, you know. Jeez, uh, crikey, that's a, that's a uh, bit of a trick to pull. My goodness, yeah, Damon, Damon, Damon. <laughs> I'd love to get Damon on here, but obviously, trying to get hold of Damon here is I'm trying to find uh, Lord, it's trying to get Lord Lucan, like but, isn't it? Oh, got no chance anyway. Um, but I had no idea that all that had gone on. Amazing, uh, um. It was obviously all politics and all for the TV and all that kind of stuff. It's been going on for years. Um, but um, was it so? That was what was it 87, 88? 87, yeah, 87. Um, 88, obviously, you you know, you stayed, stayed with the team, you took a couple of wins that year. Um, you're in the RT31, weren't you? The role, the RT31. Was there, a, I, I read somewhere there was something about. The RT31, Damon had the 32, and there was something swapping around the back end or something, and all that kind of stuff. Was it was all that kind of thing going on within the team? I, I remember I just read it somewhere. I can't remember where, but. Trust you, you that kind of worms. Hey? Sorry. We, 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 we can skip it if you like. There's no problem. <laughs> because I won the car. I mean, I knew the car like the back of my hand. I knew what made it work, and you just, it was like part of my. It was like my right, uh, my right leg or left, right arm. I knew it inside. Out. And I said to Glenn Waters because I tried to get move up, up a level, and I couldn't find the funding for it. Yeah, I did the marble tests. And there being seven drivers, and he tested these cars. And I was quickest. And a guy was stood at Redgate watching a guy called Trevor Foster, who I worked with in F three at Swallow. 
who had died then at that time was working for a, a Jordan. And so obviously he was there and he seen what happened that day. And um, I said to Glenn that if I was going to come back to F3, I didn't want to go out and buy another car. Keep my car and I will carry on where we left off. And anyway, Glenn bought two new cars in Royal, an RT32. So when I came back, reluctantly I came back, um, David started driving the RT32, and I drove my RT31. And I was competitive in RT31. I was winning races and qualifying at the front. And then David, um, I believe, allegedly, the man closed doors and planned to sell that. I had the, I had the benefit of having the use of two cars. Which was the case? I didn't drive the RT thirty two. So right. work, you thought you had both, right? Okay. Well, the one sat in the corner of the workshop. Yeah. So working back from selling that, that I had to use the RT thirty two. Got the thirty two, bit like the Renault with the Swallow. I couldn't get. I scored on top six, but not front or second row. And then to the arm, the back end of the RT thirty one, and putting the thirty two, and still not quick. So I went to sell it. The sell it. said, "Look, I'm fifty percent of the team." I said, and David, David had just won the British Grand Prix. I said, look, and I was winning races. We said, look, we don't mind, but you've got to get David's permission to go back to your old car, right? Which doesn't make sense because you think a manufacturer with a build a new car would make it automatically quicker. But when yeah. you get when you get a feel for a car and you're quick in a car and you know the car's quick, <coughs> now a six speed gearbox would be outside that because the Tom's engine had no top end speed past. I think five six five thousand six hundred RPM for my car and for super trucks. I always use a six speed box. I was stuck in a pole. Um, it was a heavier gearbox. You carry a bit more weight. So I went to Damon after he won the British Grand Prix. Said Damon said, you know, things aren't going well for me. And that's the side of the awning. I said, you know, do you mind if I go back to the RT thirty one? No, no, no. It says great, great. He's be on a high. So you right, still bother, yeah. great opportunity. I plucked that one. Car came back out for the last of the first Snedderson, <coughs> and had a, uh, I used to use a, a lock diff, and it looked like the distance was going to rain because a lock diff drives both rear wheels, so you get a lot more on the shoe, not so much front grip. Anyway, we made that call too late and let's diff in. And Eddie Jordan comes into the equation at this stage. His driver <laughs> in F3000 was a guy called Thomas Danielson, who brought sponsorship Q8, who was teammate to. Johnny Herbert. And that was the first year in 3000, you see. Right, right. And the Q8 car, yeah, yeah. And EJ got a good deal from Renault because they wanted teams. And Johnny was FA champion. So Johnny got in the drive <coughs> uh, for the year. So EJ came to me at Snell and said, Marty, I want you to drive for me. Last five races, £30,000. I know he asked him for £70,000. And I said, yeah, EJ, I can get that of Rio. I said because Frank had died at this stage. But I didn't tell Frank and you that Frank was a millionaire. He had a lot of businesses in, in Ireland. Right, right. Business was never hitting. And I knew the courts had locked up the bank account because they needed to find out who was to be allocated which funds. So Rio couldn't buy groceries or food for, like, for the five or six kids she had. Wow. Uh, I told EJ I'd go to her. So David then got word I'd done the deal and went to sell it again. Got long story short, the seller came after me financially for 600 some more grand because I reckon it's the money they spent to get me into F3. And EJ said, Marty, 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 you stick with me, I'll back you all the way, right? And he did, fair play, and he did. Goodness me. Won, won the race at Stellarton, no else. Went down to Chile and London, where all the legal people are. Went to uh, I called Fred Rogers' office. It was a legal team. Signed the contract for A Jordan Racing, right, for an office where we done the deal for uh, thirty grand. I'm thinking, how the hell am I going to swing this? But underneath that was another contract called EJ Sports Limited, right? I had to sign that. But I said, Fred, this was never discussed. He said, and he says, if you don't sign this management contract, is you're going to drive the car. But I thought, well, 15% is what he wanted of all my earnings. At the time, I wasn't earning much anyway, so I might as well have that. Um, right. And I did that. And the next race was Brands Hatch 3000, 
where uh, where Johnny had his big accident and he lost his his right foot. I won yeah. that. I went yeah. to see Johnny the next day in St Mary's Hospital in Sidcup. He's in there. It's all bandaged up, turban on his head. And I talked to him at the end of his bed. But you see, the lights were on, but there's nobody in. You know, he was dosed up on being nice. And He yeah. just remember me being there. The next race was the following weekend, which was Birmingham Super Prix. Oh I, yeah. I faced second there. So you can imagine EJ, Marty, Marty, where's the money? I've got kids to feed. Is it that hard? Where's, where's my checks? I said, look, look, I'm hit with wheels. She says, it's going to come. She's on with the, with the, with the, the, the banks. It'll be there. Cut on right. short. Five races, two wins, two seconds, a pole position, a lap record, and a DNF. But I'm talk, in fact, I went to the last race uh, of that meeting of that year with an outside chance to win the championship. So and, you're, and, and you did less than half of the races, didn't you? Five races, yeah. Wow. So I mean, EJ then became my pimp. So he realised <laughs> the, money, the money wasn't come. So he then started fork me out to drives in Japan, a group C with Richard Lloyd and teammate to Derek Bell. And he got his money back that way, okay? So right. Then, over the winter months, Marty, Marty, I want you to stay with me. Don't you sign for the bills? He says, I'll pay you. And four months down the road from Stenerton, four months, he was paying me 50k to stay. He had landed the camel money and he got myself and John Alessi to to drive for the team. Jean was bringing some money from Max Meyer, so he wasn't on the deal I was on. And you know, all of a sudden, Camel then came into the equation. Camel sponsored the Lotus F1 team. Sure. I lived on the doorstep. He was going to see them. They'd come with test days at, at Snedden and Fulham because as you see, see the cars down prior to going to Europe. I just still was on uh, F1 test, four days, qualified tires. I think the Autosport magazine then, which was the Bible of Motorsport, front page of that said, is done in the next month. So, and they signed me up then for the 1990 F1 season. Wow, that's so, amazing. That's what happened, but I ran through that very quickly. Yeah, yeah, of course, <clears throat> of course. So, and obviously this is all down to Eddie Jordan. I mean, we all know yeah. about Eddie. I mean, he... Neither <laughs> I mean, I, I want to come on to the F1 Lotus in a meeting again that I read about recently. Um, but, oh, that's a good question uh, while we're on the subject uh, from uh, uh, Diffan Evans. Evening, Diffan. He said, what did you think of the Birmingham Super Prix and the circuit and the racing and everything around it? Because I remember it with the British touring cars and the F3000 thinking, even when I was nine, thinking this is absolute insanity. <laughs> Mad. It was mad. But you have to say, you know, <coughs> people were determined to make that happen. And at the time, it was a great success. But the circuit, oh my God, was so rough and bumpy. There were certain corners you were going down to that there were so many bumps. Your 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 eyeballs became um, chuckers over, so you couldn't see. In fact, David Hunt went off the, one of the corners I'm talking about, hit the outside curb, that launched him like a like a launch pad. He missed the tire barrier and the armico barrier and went into a brick wall, a factory yeah, he, wall. Didn't you punch a hole in it? On the wall, yeah. That's I mean it's just madness. I remember who was the dry when they had the when they bought the crane in, was it um, was it Russell Spence. Russell Spence and he was still in the car, they were lifting him up. <laughs> he wasn't going to get out because he wanted to stop the race. Because if he could stop the race, it was a fucking first lap, and you could get going again and start again. Uh, but they wouldn't stop it. Eventually, the, the road was blocked. And because we could just, they just lift them away and put them to the side, or they were like an inconvenience. But we all got back on the grid. And eventually, he got his car back again. And he drove back to, to the grid. I think, look up your check, your record books. Did they let him to start? I don't think so. I think he had to start. No. The, I, don't, I don't remember him being featured much after that. Yeah, he was that. Yeah, because like, uh, because of all that, they had to cancel the British touring car meeting. I think because of the time and uh, taken. Yeah, yeah. I'd but, have to see it back, but it won't happen, will it? <laughs> there was some word back about four or five years ago that somebody in the Birmingham Council wanted to try and resurrect it again. You know, so they did a bit of radio. Oh, I don't think we've frozen just for a moment there. Hang on, one second. I think the uh... oh, it's frozen for me here, folks. Oh, Martin has he's dropped out. He'll be back soon. Oh, he's back already. 
Um, so he's just going to sort his camera out. Sorry about that, folks. This is the joy of live streaming. Um, yeah, you don't get this on these uh, polished throwbacks. Here we go. There we go. Are we back again? Hey, there we go. Works right. Have to pay for the premium internet connection. <laughs> um, Fifty p in the slot. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> it's either the uh, it's either the iPad or or the light bulbs, isn't it? It's one um so yeah i mean obviously yeah we'd like to yeah we'd love to see it come back again the birmingham super pre but I'm not sure it'd be allowed these days Cer it's certainly not bit, on the layout it was on it's a bit like you go back to northern ireland northern ireland is rife for uh public road motorbike racing the dunlops the hislams yeah. the dun um um don't i said dunlops uh but insurance now is just priced by the equation they reckon and well, well they, they've only just got it back on track in the last couple of weeks, haven't they? Because it was going to not happen this year. Yeah, they, they said it wasn't going to happen. And there's been a huge crowdfunding thing to pay for the insurances and everything. And they're back racing again. 40 grand, I reckon that's going to cost them. Even down south at Mandelo, they're, they're not public roads. They can race, race it. But now if they've, got, if they've got the money for it, they'll fair play them. Because, you know, there's about six road races each year in Ireland. And the insurance is just price of the equation yeah but if you're saying it's back on again fantastic i'm sure it's broken in the last couple of weeks i'm sure i saw it somewhere that uh it's all going ahead i think it was glenn Irwin. glenn Irwin has said yeah it's happening so yeah happy days good. um it is good to see i love a street race anyone who's watched any of these knows that i love a street race um i mean just before we get on to the f1 side of things um Obviously, you mentioned a few sort of names there about about the Rat Pack and everything. We're gonna. I want to come to them just at the end, but um, it was a heck of a, a crop of drivers we had in the UK, wasn't it? I mean, obviously there was, yeah, there was you, there was Damon, there was Johnny, Mark Blundell, um, some chap who ended up being the Stig. Uh, obviously, you know, we've got like Perry and Steve Soper, Julian, all, all and all those guys. I mean, I read somewhere that you were all great mates at the time, of course, and you still are. But I heard a great line. I think it was from you. You said that you, or was it Mark? Was it Mark? I can't remember. Past, be prepared. To, be, be prepared to eat some grass. That's the one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If you're going to pass, it's, it's not going to be on the black stuff. <laughs> we used to always go and play golf together. We went on a test day, then you have a day off. So we go home. We go and play golf at this or Ryan Silverstone here, or even Zandvoort. We went and played golf, you know, and we all play golf together and. We all went to Marky's uh, wedding and to a stag do. Um, and we're all still very close to Mark's gone into base touring cars now. He runs doing very well, yeah, doing very well for himself. And you know, but we all realized that we're all year in, year out trying to chase each other's drives. You know, Damon, we called, we got a nickname in the end called the Secret Squirrel because he'll never tell you who he's talking to. Uh, because in case you went talking to them yourself. And Nick just drive. We all have, we all got nicknames, and I'm your man because back on Northern Ireland, everybody's called all right, our man, right? <laughs> uh, Perry's called Mad Dog, he's just totally do lally. He goes off, the, yeah. Off the, I've actually had Perry on here, he's brilliant, isn't he? Yeah, he, he, is, is. he is brilliant. He misses devotion in life, he should have been a stand up comedian. He's very, absolutely, very, yeah. yeah. He said, then, um, there was a great line he said to me. He said that he was, um, he was, he does his motive, yeah, this after dinner speaking, the motivational speaking, and he said that. There was a job that he got asked to do as a motivational speaker, but he turned it down because he couldn't be bothered. <laughs> <laughs> That's very, That's very, yeah. Or they weren't better, they weren't better, better enough. And then Mark Bandell, we used to call him Mega because he used to have back in the NF3 Mega watches and Mega clothes and Mega mega girlfriends. Sorry, Debs. And uh, who else? We had Johnny Herbert, the little one because he was quite small. Um, and so went on. We all, we all referred to yeah. us on emails like. Uh, regards your man regards things like that you know lovely i love that and obviously you still get together now you know that's what we'll come to that soon i'll see you yeah but, you know, I've, I've 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 had derek on here he was probably the first sort of big f1 driver i had on here um yeah and he speaks very Del fondly of you guys del boy yeah 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 um he actually said it was the first time that his um that his car dealership over in jersey had ever had um a um an email submitted through the contact form on the on the on the website asking for an interview you know normally it's a test drive or a finance issue <laughs> but 
but you charge your arm. Um, obviously, just when we come on to um, when when we come on to Derek, you ended up um, uh, stepping in for him at Arrows uh, in '89. Paul Ricard, um, your F1 debut. Just quickly, how did that come about? Because um, as as you said, there was things rumbling on with Camel and Lotus and all that for 1990. How how did the Arrows drive come together? Because that car was beautiful. That was a beautiful car. About through again, EJ. EJ is my manager. I'm the manager to Sean Alessi and, and Eddie Irvine and Johnny Herbert. You know, uh, and he just he could smell it. Dale and Del Boy was doing, I believe, a hill climb event in Jersey. And for whatever possessed him, but are you doing it in a go kart? One of these fast gearbox carts, I think. As you do. <laughs> and he lost control, and I think he went under the front of a Ford Transit van, right? Yeah. And did his back in very uh, quite badly, whereby he could have, because to be a F, driving F1 car, it is very, very physical. And at that Suzanne test, I did well. And AJ got on the phone to Jackie Oliver. And him and him and Jackie were, were quite good friends. And Jackie was a great driver drove for Lotus back in the day, then did an EJ says own team up. And um he said, Look, you know, this guy thought he was quick, you can see at Silverstone, he was quicker than uh, PK and like a G man, he's the, the real deal. So I got the deal and I was told by Eddie, right, Marty, get your kit. He's a friend's gonna meet you at the airport with your airline tickets, and you gotta get yourself to uh, Port Ricard. Which I did, you know, it all happened in like lightning time, crazy lightning time. Wow. And so how it, far before the race was this? Say again? How far before the actual Grand Prix weekend was this? Was it like two or three? The week, the week off. The midweek? Off. Wow. Monday, Monday, Tuesday of the week, that week. Like Del Boy did the accident on the weekend behind them. Now, if EJ was doing the job right, okay, he may be critical on my high horse. John Alessi at the time was leading the European 2000 Championship. Mm. He's, he's born French Sicilian, right? Yes. He lives in, God, it's the top of my head, near, he lives about 50 miles from Paul Ricard. And John now actually is a certain manager of Paul Ricard as we speak. Okay. okay. He's been bespoke that in the last, I think, four weeks. Oh, wow. Now, if he gave the job right, he would say, look, you know, Jackie, I've uh, got John Lassie, French driver, knows the circuit inside. He's raced during French F3. He's leading the European uh, 3000 Championship. He's he's, a, he's the guy who should put in the seat. And logically, that's what most people have done. Sure. He just pushed me for it, which I don't think went down too well with John at the time. That same week, Turl landed some sponsorship from Camel to put the Camel in on the rear uh, engine cover. Yeah, on the yellow on the back there. I remember that, yeah. The drivers were Jonathan Palmer, uh, Michele Alboreto. Alboreto. But Alboreto was sponsored personally by Marlboro, and he refused to take the Marlboro's overalls. So EJ again somehow got word that Alboreto had lost his drive. Ken, Ken, I've got the driver for you. It's Sean Leslie. He's French. He knows the circuits. He knows the circuit well. He's leading the championship. and You've got to give him a go. Give him a try. So all of a sudden, Jean then got the Turl drive. Right. Of course, that Turl had the Super Soft Pirelli qualifying tyres. Race tyres were anything special. Mm. And uh, Jean got the drive for, for, for that. And then if you look into he, 1990... He qualified fourth, didn't he, or something? He, he... Top 10. I forget what it was, top 10. But look, mm. at, the, look at Pirelli's in 1990. Uh, Martini, Pierre Martini, and in the Monarch, qualified in the front row. Sean in the little Turl with a little... John Engine qualified second row. That was so Phoenix, wasn't it? Yeah. Final guys were behind them because, you know, the good guitar was as good as the Predator. Right. And in a heartbeat, if VJ had put Alessi into the, uh, the Arrows drive and me in the Turl drive, who could say what happened? Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but well, Eddie basically got his way and got you both in, didn't he? <laughs> he did, yeah. He did care. He's getting his money, wasn't he? Well, yeah, yeah. If he's going to get some money in his back pocket, he's going to do it. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, it was the following year that Tyrrell had that proper with the little up the nose, the blue and white one. It's Phoenix, wasn't it? Whereas Jean did all his bits and he raced with Senna, passed Senna, passed him, he passed on the back. Jean was a great street racer. I mean, Monaco and Paul, he, he raced and won. He wasn't that shabby around Birmingham. 
So he, he had an aptitude for it. Yeah. Uh, and obviously he went on to bigger and better things. He'd actually signed for Williams for the 1991 season. I I, I heard a rumour about this. Is, is, no, is no, this all true? It's fact. But then Ferrari came knocking. And being Sicilian, which Italian driver doesn't want to drive for Ferrari? Of course. And somewhere along the line, so he paid some money and bought him out of his Williams contract and he signed for Ferrari. Now, Jean, in hindsight, they put Mansell then back in the car for 92, 91, didn't they? Became world champion. That was the FW15, yeah. The... In that active special car and became world champion. His stock value being higher and Ferrari won even more so. Italian driver back in the Ferrari, you know? But. Right. You know, we haven't, got a, we haven't got a crystal ball, have we, in life? No, no. I mean, I spoke um, la- last week, I'd like Fabrizio Giovanardi came on, and he said when he was racing in single-seaters, it was like Camel and Marlborough were the two. Oh, yeah. you know, and, and he didn't know which way to go, and he went down the Camel side. He said, in hindsight, you should have gone. <laughs> but, hey, hey. Hey, Lord, the Mackay, when I raced our for an 88, he had... He had one car backed with Marlboro sponsorship. One car was Irish driven, backed by Camel, and the other car, the third car team, backed by Mile Seven. So one, okay. so they had the three different tobacco sponsors. It's only EJ can put that sort of deal off. Lord how knows you, what would all behind closed doors for that deal. How can you pull that off? Goodness me! <laughs> That's why everyone loves him. Um, yes. um, but you had the. Uh, you had the drive um, with the Arrows um, team. I've got it in my mind. You qualified at 14th That's around so there, and, um, and, you t- and you got it to the finish in 12th. Um, memories of that? Was it everything you expected it to be, F1? Um, I didn't know the public, public card circuit, so I had to learn. I had to learn, I don't know I said that. I had to learn that. We didn't go there in F3000. I had to learn that. And a teammate there called Eddie Cheever. Yeah, was, I've 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 had Eddie on here. He's very forthright, isn't he? He did, yes. he's very <laughs> Well he qualified I qualified him. All of a sudden his 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 uh wife forgot how to learn to, to speak English. I know I know no Cabrini. So the doors came down there for both really myself and my fiance at the time, Diane. Um and the race came and there's a big if you remember big first corner shot where one the, men went, yeah. Yeah, and one just just touched my front suspension. I don't know for for quite a while, and one of the boys spun a little nick in the front um, uh, wishbone. So then I had to start from the pit lane along with Mans and somebody else in any Cheever's car. And I just, the balance of the car was horrendous. It was just, it was just, as soon as you the car into a corner, it just, opposite lock was on the whole time. And it was a very, very hot and physical race. I was just glad to finish it. When I actually went across the finish line, I dropped my head down because normally you do a slow down lap and come in. To what they call a park for me. Yeah. And when I got up from putting my head down for exhaustion, I was going between marshals, there were about a row of six marshals across the track, diverting people off to a park for me about 50 metres off the, the first turn village line. And they oh, killed man. somebody, a, a, a marshal, yeah. So I went all the way down to the first corner, to the three point turn, and came back up the track again. Oh, crazy. <laughs> I didn't realise you were um, um, in. Uh... Uh, in this I spare car for Eddie, I didn't realise that. I always murdered somebody after the race was finished. It made me realise then just how uh, physically unfit I was, you know, because I could do a three thousand race, and those car aren't those races aren't as long, probably about twice as an F three thousand race is about half the length of an F one race, but they're a lot less physical. F one a lot more G force uh, in cornering and brake acceleration, and it made me realise I need to get back to the gym. Yeah. And, uh, crack on because if I was going to go to F1 I need to be ready to make the use of the opportunity to come along next time sure yeah. sure and obviously I guess the wheels were in motion for 1990 at this point anyway or they were just getting started uh, I resigned signed for Lotus I think look it up again in Wikipedia I think in September just okay. before the race at Monza because I was testing at the Bugatti Circuit at Le Mans private plane that took me to Italy, where my hair was all like grease on the helmet head, works looking like immaculate, you know, the, the, the gel cream in and the, the dye in. And the announcers there as the drivers then for the 1990 season. Wow. Yeah. Um, now, moving on to 1990, obviously, we'll come to the incident um, shortly. But um, again, I read somewhere that you and Eddie went up to Lotus um, 
up to the HQ to sort the deal out and everything. Um, was it true that they put something in front of you in terms of a financial package? And Eddie said, right, rip their arm off. And you said, no, I'm going to go back and ask for more. No, I've, no, I've no, no. heard that mumbling, so I don't know if it's true or not. We were going to Hethel, no Hethel, sorry, Kedrigham, uh, where the team was based in this old sort of period at uh, home. Um, they sit down and go through a contract with Peter, Peter War, uh, Freddie Bushel, and I had Fred, I had EJ and Fred Rogers, who was the legal arm, right? And uh, we walked in, and I think it's all the very nice pleasantries. How are you? Blah blah. Sorry to drag away from London. Peter's very apologetic. And um, we started to speed read through this contract, okay? And um, when you're in F1, there's various perks you get, various perks you don't get. Like the team will pay for the fly, the long haul flyway flights, but the European flights you have to pay for yourself. You pay for your hotels and you get points for, for F1. Your points for any points you get in F1, blah, blah, blah. A lot of things like that. So I spoke to Peter. Now, people may not realize this, but Eddie, who's always very gobby and very quick to chat and slap you off, just went stum, really? stum. I said nothing. I'm thinking, I'm thinking, has Peter War pet Eddie off like 20, 30, 50K to shut up, send on, and we'll sign this guy to a contract that's very much based one sided, right? And those things were going through my mind at the time. I even Fred once said anything. So I said, can I speak to any of Fred uh, about this contract? Yeah, yeah. Step outside. We had to step outside to the hallway where you come into the building. They stayed in the big boardroom. And he just got the contract rolled up in A4 side. He said, Marty, Marty, isn't this great? He says, he says, what's wrong with this contract? He said, and he said, pardon my friends, he said, this is, I said, this is a great contract. Is it? It's it's not faking Formula Three. Formula Three. Don't you don't you spoil this for me, right? Because EJ is on fifteen percent of what I was going to earn. Right, of course, yeah, yeah. And you sort of think, well, all the self doubts you have inside your head, is Eddie working for for Camel Peter War and not looking at the right behalf? And I said, well, Eddie, they're not paying for enough enough money. And he hit me, Marty, Marty, it's not money. That's what he said. You should be glad you should he, to me. Don't you fake this up for me? So we went back into this table. I said, look, a couple of things. I said, Peter, the remuneration fee, I said, isn't enough. He said, they're offering me um they're offering me a million over um three years, right? But they had the options on their side. And I said, I need that needs to increase. And he said, Well, how much are we talking about? No. Me being naive back those in those days, and I've learned a lot more since I've watched Eddie and some of his other various deals that he did. If I had have said 1.5, he'd probably said, oh, a bit steep, but I'm sure we distressed you. But little old me said 1.2, and he said, Okay, fine, yeah, I'm sure we can manage that. Can we manage that, Fred? Yeah, we can. Uh, it's Freddie Bush, yeah, we can manage that. And I thought that was too quick for him to turn around and say, Yeah, that's fine. Not even to flinch, I think. You mop it. I think Eddie. You could have gone in higher. <laughs> exactly. You could have gone 1.5, 1.7, you know. Because when you find out the figures that that that, that Seligan paid individually from McLaren and they paid Warwick unknown to me for that year a million, which I didn't know about, you know. Wow. So and I also there's other things that I said about uh, the flights and again. So I got my way of those things. So all of a sudden you're an F1, you're you're privileged to be one of the world's top 26 drivers and being paid for the privilege so you can't you've got to put up with a bad job you're happy to accept the money at the time get on with it and if you believed in life when you did a deal with any jordan if you if you honestly believed that he wasn't going to make money from you then you know you're in the wrong business because he's, he's out there for himself eddie's words about eddie and look where he is now living in cape town i think doing very nicely and he's done very nicely out of things you've got to look after number one sometimes haven't you and he's got the mouth to do it hasn't he so <laughs> yes um so you've signed the deal for 1990 you're gonna be driving alongside Derek who you ironically replace um with in arrows and things like that um 
Just very quickly, I mean, Derek was mighty. Under, I mean, he's one of the first drivers I latched onto in 86 when I first got into um, F1. It was Nigel and Ayrton and Nelson. And then, obviously, Derek got the drive after. Um, well, bear, after bear, bear in mind, Derek left once in 1982. Yeah, with yeah, Renault yeah. and with everyone and Tom and all the teams. And, yeah, yeah. Um, and I got into F1 then. And he's hugely underrated uh, when people talk about the great drivers of that sort of time one person who didn't under one person who didn't underrate underrate him was a chap called Ayrton Senna who didn't want him in the team did he at Lotus he didn't want him in there he was like nope too and, good and, and Lotus had signed Warwick to a contract at that stage so they were oh. obviously quite keen to get Ayrton on board because along with Ayrton came the Honda engines of course so, yes because he yeah yeah and they they loved it. He was a big, big name back in Japan. A huge name. He's like a god in, in Japan and Brazil. And they wanted the engines to go for the camel money. So they had to let Derek out of that contract. How much they had to pay him, how, how that deal was done. Uh, I never actually asked Derek that question before. Um, and then came I Ayrton. And they, they bought and joined DeVries, who at that time was British F3 champion. But... Johnny was the Earl of the, the Earl of Buttes and yes. he had family money behind him. Um and the rest is history. Ayrton brought the team success. There's a regularly run the car to front. He won some races until he realized that Lotus really couldn't take him much further and the big dollars were being waved um from McLaren and every man and woman has their price. And off went uh, out that way yeah. with the agents. Yeah, of course he took Honda with him because yeah, they were going to go with. They went from Williams to McLaren, and yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, you've got. I mean, we'll come to Ayrton very shortly, but you've got you've got the drive. Um, did I remember there was a claim? Was it Rupert Mannering said they were going to be pushing for top sixes and wins like that? I mean, was there any was there any expectation from your side for your first year? on how you would do or was it just a case of let's see where it goes and what and what was the car like to drive as well it was a case of appreciate what you've got because we knew that we hadn't got the quickest corner grid i mean they they brought in this lamborghini v12 engine and they went from a small jod v8 the year before to this v12 because they they believed they're going to get this massive bunch of horsepower and at the end of the day, the Italians showed them a, uh, um, a, dip, a dump squid because we had 640 big horsepower, uh, which was nothing in comparison to the Honda and Ferrari, which is uh, between 890 and 890 and 930 big horsepower. Wow. So when we went to circuits that had long straights like Silverstone, Hockenheim, you might as well just stay in the garage, you have no chance. But short circuits like Monaco uh, um, and elsewhere. We I guess had Hungary would be one. Yeah, Hungary. We could do reasonably well. I mean, I qualified, I think, 11th overall in uh, Monaco, which was a great, great effort, if I say so myself. Um, I faced seventh in Hungary. And any time a seventh Del Boy went qualifying, we would qualify within hundreds, not not tenths or seconds, hundredths. And Del Boy's two favourite circuits, uh, Silverstone and Monaco, I managed to put a big effort in and I qualified him. So mm-hmm. by the time I had my accident, I had four F1 contracts from Turrell, Arrows, Eddie Jordan, Jordan Grand Prix, and, and Lotus. But Lotus had the option of my services, which decided more of the accident. For five point six million, which thirty on the morning million. of the accident. Yeah, but two, two, three hours before the accident, they signed up on the, on the, the option because where was getting around, I had these these offers, and thirty three years ago, five point six million was a decent a decent uh, income. Mm-hmm. So I I I twelve races, I had impressed enough people for them to realise that I could I could pedal a car quite quickly. And obviously, yeah. you know, you, you come in, you've got to do your due diligence, serve your time, keep your nose clean, don't get involved in accidents, taking it to big people, and then the teams and the sponsors all of a sudden want you to like a race in a car like 
Miles McGrath into from from um, Lotus into, into Williams into Ferrari back to Williams. You know, yeah. you've got to, you've got to bide your time, but you've got at the same time not blot, blot your copybook by being a shunter like unfortunately like Mick Schumacher was last year. You know that's why this year he's on the sidelines. Mick was rookie of three champion, rookie of three champion. He he can drive a car, mm. but all that pressure that comes in you from going up against Kevin Magnussen from from the press with the Schumacher name, people don't appreciate the amount of pressure that that, that kid at a young age was 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 under. And it's a great great travesty that his dad, who's seven times world champion, isn't there as an ambassador, maybe say to Mercedes or to Ferrari, to put his arm around him to guide him, a bit like Yoss does for for um, for. for Max. You know, I think that's one of the biggest criminal things of, of Schumacher's accent. That's, that's a good point. I mean, that doesn't get mentioned, does it? I mean, obviously, Mick's been thrown in. He's got the name. Um, but he hasn't got the help from yeah. his dad. And Pfizer would be his dad. And his dad's not doing that one. Yeah, which is awful, awful. I, f- I believe it's Mick Schumacher's birthday today. So if it, I'm sure it's, it is. So. This. Here's to Happy Mick. birthday, Mick! If you ever see this, because um, <laughs> yeah. Toto will get you get you another opportunity. To come back. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, just before we get on to the accident, I mean, I saw a question here from uh, Chris McMahon. He says, "What did you think of the Lambo V12 and the Lotus?" Obviously, Derek wasn't very complimentary of it. Um, was there any development of it during the season, or was it just as as was? I don't. I don't remember anything specifically about new development on the Lambo. V12 sound of great. I mean, of all the engine notes on the on the grid, you hear the car come a mile away, and it was a great, great sound of thing. We may have had some different fuel maps, but as a regards to hiking horsepower and another like 10, 12, 15 horsepower, nothing sticks up in my mind. Okay. We had a lot of reliability issues with with, with the with the engine. Yeah, I'm sure you had a lot of a few retirements that year from the mechanical side. Um, just very quickly, um. Um, and um, and, just, and, just, and, and just, Brockless. Just to answer that question, what's the car like to drive? The, oh. the car we drove was the car that belonged to PK like a Jeep of the year before. Right. Small, five foot eight, five foot seven, uh, for like a Jeep, or five foot six. We, Seth and Derek, were both ten, uh, five foot ten. So we couldn't really get in the cockpit comfortably because our, le- our foot was on the throttle pedal and our right knee was on the bulkhead. So after about 12, 20 laps, your leg would go numb. So you couldn't feel the pressure pushing on the throttle pedal and the brake. So they had to get us to come out of the, the cockpit to get out, get off the throttle pedal. Right, so that's why you were so high. Like... The regulation where, if I turn sideways, you know, that guy has to be 10 mil. supposed to come out. We broke that rule. So they got a glass fibre cone and stuck it at the top of the, the cockpit. So we got it. We got, I got pictures of me going around the Lowe's Herp in a Monaco, and I've got people me more out of the car with full lock on, they are going to be more above the tub than actually down in the tub of the car. And that's why there's that hump on the front of the car. I thought there was guys past the, the regulation of, of the 10 mil above your above your head. Wow. Amazing. And what they did was, because they got the V12 engine, and the engine was a lot heavier than the V8, they made the tub a lot lighter. And right. Yes, we had at the second race weekend at Interlagos, the tub actually, the nose cone bolts on to the front of the tub. We put more front wing on, we had must have a bit of understeer somewhere. And the extra downforce actually broke off the front of the tub uh, during the free practice on the Friday. Uh, and we had no spare car then. So the FA allowed Lotus to repair that with resins and glue to work and race the following day. Wow. So we had the issue with the front of the car breaking off early, early, you know, early in the season, which obviously yeah. leads us on to what sort of happens next. I mean, just very quickly, um, said um, we've got Ben Mercer. He said that he'll see Mick at Albert Park next week. Pass on happy birthday wishes. Ben, send me a message. I, I need to talk to you. Right. Um, sorry, shameless plug there. Ben, drop the hard compound a message. Um, we, we've got to talk. Um, so... <sighs> Obviously, you've gone through the season. You've had some strong finishes. The cars have not been reliable, and but the engine's not great in the tub. But um, I mean, you've spoken about this about a hundred thousand times. I'm going to make it one more. Um, the accident. I mean, we, we all know. 
unfortunately in F1, it's probably what you're best known for, unfortunately, which is hugely unfair. Um, just because of the morbid nature of the human mind, I think. Um, I mean, I don't know where to start with it, to be honest. I mean, I I know there was a, there was an issue with the suspension and a bell crank thing, and but you'd gone out on the Friday morning, you'd, and you'd put in and you'd thumped in a good time, hadn't you? You were in the top six or seven, weren't you? And then yeah, yeah. tight races well, to be competitive. We don't need top end horsepower, so we're we're looking good. Because mm, uh, it's they, quite a twisty track. A short twisty, uh, quite a physical track, uh, and quite a hot climate. But the team worked out if I'd gone through the last corner, which was the last herpin, if I had lasted a split mega second, I'd have gone off at speed across a crawl trap and into Tarbar. Okay, I may have been slightly hurt, but the car would have broken half like the way it did. And if I had completed that lap, I would have qualified either P5 or P6 overall. It would have been wow. awesome, you know. But if but maybe he's don't uh, don't win prizes. Well, no, no. Um, I mean, obviously we'll come to the details of it in in a sec. But I mean, I mentioned we had Derek on, who was your teammate at the time. I asked him about this, um, and obviously he said that if you know he never had any issues with the safety of the car, he never felt unsafe in it, anything like that. He said. After your accident on the Friday, on the Saturday, he want, he didn't want to go in and qualify. He he just went in on, on I, I guess he's spoken to you about this, and he didn't want to go in, but they, because obviously the car had broken in half, he said, has it been fixed where the car broke? And he was told, the team said, yeah, we've put this and this on it. It's not going to happen. And he went out two minutes later, got in the car and went around that corner flat. Yeah. I guess that doesn't surprise you about Derek. Actually, to tell the truth, that, that corner at the time, because you're wrong, full downforce, it was quite an easy corner to take fast. Mm. So much downforce. What, what I was told was they weren't actually ever sure at that time when the circuit what broke in the car. Okay, right. I, I've been back there last summer. I've done a, a new documentary. If I'm going to plug myself. It's on Sky F1 TV. It's called On the Edge of Life, and it's about 21 minutes old. And been back to the circuit, we're at the accident, I've been to Classic Team Lewis doing interviews and being back to Belfast where I was brought up on the on the rough side with the peace divide there, which I didn't realise was, was still active. Every day from ten o'clock to six o'clock is closed to divide the two communities uh, to divide the two communities. And that oh. supposed to have peace in Northern Ireland. Anyway, let's move on. Well, we're gonna uh, watch that. Mm. So they weren't able to reassure Delpoint and say, we found the problem. All they could say to Derek was, we've checked everything we can going forward to the front of the car. Um, as far as we are aware, nothing is weak or unsecure. And what the team did wrong, in Derek's opinion, in my opinion, they left that decision down to him. That shouldn't have been that de his decision. That sure. should be a team decision. So sure. like, they should have said, we don't know what it was, we can't guarantee your safety. Can you imagine if driving out in that qualifying race actually broke again? Yeah. They've been sued to high tilt for being irresponsible. Yeah. And Del Boy, There'd be no Lotus left, you know. <laughs> Del Boy being Del Boy knew the team needed the coverage, needed the money, the sponsors to keep paying. So Del Boy did that for the team's benefit, not wow. for his benefit. He did that so the team would keep him paying money and the boys would have jobs and people pay their mortgages. Wow. Uh, that was that was wrong with him, but Del Boy did it, okay. Um, and then obviously in then after me, I think came Johnny for the last I think two races, which was Suzuka and Adelaide, and then they could signed up the next year be alongside Nick Hackett, because Peter Collins was the team manager then. Right, right, gotcha. gotcha. So the the more of the story is, the team should never let the um, Derek make the decision. That should be a team decision. Sure. And the wrong, um, Leave down to him. He told me that himself. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I got the feeling when I spoke to him, he wasn't. He was never hundred percent sure. And the reason why he made the decision was to keep the team involved in the sport and keep going for the sake of the employees. Wow. So, okay, Derek is great man. Amazing. What a great guy! Great guy. I mean, um, okay, coming back to the elephant in the room, the accident. I mean, I. I saw a thing on you. You saying about there was an issue with the suspension and the, there was a bell crank that had broken. And this, I mean, I guess you have no memory of the weekend. I mean, I remember. I mean, 
when you when you see the images that we've all seen, um, happily there's no footage. I don't ever want to see any footage of it because. Oh, and I believe the team put out the PAR to to the public. If anybody was using a camcorder at the time, who was recording at the time, could they please look at the footage because they were like to know themselves what broke. But you can actually see there's a line just before I get towards the apex. But the first there's two fast fights there. Mm. Uh, and it takes like six game between both apexes. And with the carbon straight on. And there's there's no run of area. So I'm basically with that bell crank, uh, the bell crank is working loose under the tub. Then has two rods to the top of the damper neck with a small bell crank. And all the friction on there was like, it's like a coat hanger. It'll always break at, at, at its weakest point. Right. And the damper neck broke off on the left side. So that basically, you're on the tarmac, the tub's on the tarmac. You're like right in a bobsleigh. No right. steering control, no brake control, and straight in 176 miles per hour. <laughs> a light tub, lightly made, constructed made. And that's actually what saved me, was the fact that I went with the inertia and got thrown out of the car. Right, stopping. I didn't, say I didn't go with the inertia, and I broke his neck. That's why we all wear hands devices. Jeez, I mean, 42G, uh, that's ridiculous. I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and obviously, it took Sid Watkins... 11 and a half minutes to get to me because he's really? in the pit lane in a, a slow car, Trabant. And so oh. I quite through all the lap. First, I was lying at the pit lane entry. He come to me, he opened my visor, and he could see that I was asphyxiated. I got a peel shade of blue. So he knew it swallowed my tongue. So he cut the hemostop off me. Bear in mind, I breathe and breathe oxygen for 11 minutes. Senna was there because my son was Senna. I told you we're good friends back in the early days and we've talked sometimes in the paddock and he's there watching say perform what he did cut my overalls open a lot of blood because my femur came out the side of my leg and, and he had to get me stabilized which he did and got me back into the second medical got me uh sedated and organized to fly then to seville by our ambulance and my mechanics had to go out to the track with bin bags and pick up all the broken bits of carbon fiber, all the syringes that have been used and left on the side of the track. Now, can you imagine oh, the mental effects that's happening on your mechanics? Oh, who's geez. working on Derek's car. You know, it was wrong, very wrong. Wow, that shouldn't have been their, been their job. That wasn't their job. Can you can see me. when I had the accident, if you watch the Senate film, there's guys there with doctors wearing blue overalls. And they were instructed by Sid Watkins, the FIA medical delegate at the time. They were an accident. They couldn't touch any of the drivers until Sid got there first, right? In fact, the next day, Sid asked for a faster car. So a young lad was driving down from Madrid down to Seville. On the outskirts of Seville, he had a road accident. He ended up in the hospital as well. Wrote the, oh. wrote the Porsche off that he was driving. He's put in the cheap, the cheap hospital. He then asked to be put in the same hospital that I was in because it used to Watkins would be there to be to look after him. Um, wow. <laughs> I tell you, it'll be on the book. The book comes out before Christmas. And um, oh, I did quote someone did mention the book, but that's very good. Uh, that's amazing. That is a wow. I mean, so they, Diurton was there, get me stabilized, fly me to Seville, and Diurton did the press conference, which you have to do to get pole position. And he wouldn't take any questions from the floor. And there's, you can hear Pinto. I got a recording of it somewhere. And he, he spoke to the press and told them the reasons why he did what he did. Because back in the day, you qualified on Friday or qualified on Saturday. And everybody knows the motorsport enthusiasts. The more laps you do around the circuit, you leave a, a filament of rubber on the track, which gives you more grip. And the track is faster. But I went back out after my accident and said the fastest time ever. And I'm a pricker the next day as well. Did his debrief, uh, jumped, got changed, jumped into his hard car and drove 40 minutes down to the hospital in Seville. Uh, found the ITU unit. Mark Gallagher, a good friend of mine, was there. Went to see what was going to happen to me, what the doctor would say. Was I going to die or stay alive? So the Irish journalists were back in Seville in the press room. He could phone them and tell them. In came Senna. I was watching through the, the ITU windows as me all sedated on a on a respirator another respirator at that stage and he told uh gallagher mark he said in the donnelly family any financial assistance 
if they need a uh, air ambulance or any medical support, anything at all, to let him know, and he would pay for it or organize it for me. That was all Ireland. Yeah, all Ireland. Wow. Uh, Tim Walkins knew from his experience that because my it turns out moved so much in my body that my body would go into shock. Uh, so he sedated me, threw me by air ambulance from Seville to Gatwick Airport because the, the the Royal London Hospital where Sid works from in Whitechapel has a helipad. Wow. Through the chopper to, to Gatwick, are the air ambulance in the helicopter back to the hospital in Whitechapel and into the uh, intensive care and everything that Sid feared would happen did happen on the Wednesday. My whole body, my internal organs all closed down. So I was on a respirator for seven weeks, hence the reason why I've got a very husky voice. And if any of you guys listening can be bothered to look up um, uh, Birmingham Super Parade 1989. You'll see that I don't speak like this. I'm not cost becoming a right snob. <laughs> I, I, I was on a kidney dialysis machine yeah. for three hours every day, and they couldn't get the machine to stay on. So my father, for three hours every day, stood there with his finger on the button while I got this oil change, blood change, through my system. Yeah. It, was, it, was a company, it was a company of errors, you know. And they <laughs> said to my mother uh, early on that he didn't expect me to see the night through she's a very religious woman and that that he said say your prayer for for martin if you want to go and get the the hospital chaplain just to get in the last rites then please do that which she did so i got the last rites in my bed in the intensive care ward and she stood up on night prayer for me and here i am it's hard to keep it's hard to keep a good man there's many uh among that more operations I was on the operating table and twice they had to get the jump leads to, to jump start the heart again because I stopped breathing again. So, so ten, three times in total. That... Yeah, yeah. So I had the circuit, I should have died. And then on the operating tables, and I'm still here to, to talk about it. I die now on, on a regular basis. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that is unreal. I, I can't. There's nobody, there's nobody in life by myself i got three great kids who i love dearly my two boys are very much involved in motorsport my youngest guy is a college he breeds snakes OD constrictors you go there and buy snakes from 20 foot to one foot to 12 inches uh so please support his business my other son is a, a matrimonial solicitor and my daughter goes to uh nottingham trent and she wants to train to be a safari vet so but all wow. different individually, and we support them as much as we can. But unfortunately, they don't, they don't know me with two normal legs as being a professional driver. You know? Sure, sure. In the early, in, yeah, in the, in the after. I mean, you mentioned you, very quickly. I mean, you mentioned um, um, your leg. I mean, I apologies. I I noticed your limp at the Autosport show because you've had a chat. Um, I actually like yeah that that you were um, that you were limping there, and I was like, and because I was sitting just behind. Yes. Rob Gravit and you came over and had a chat with Rob. I was sitting just behind him and I went, I know that voice. Well, that's, that's Martin Donnelly, I know. <laughs> and I came and found you, as you remember. Um, but yeah, the little, little, little deal on the sidelines there as well. Sorry? I was just doing a little sideline deal with Rob at the same time. Uh, yeah, I wasn't going to ask because obviously he's involved with a company, but we'll. I'm not here for promoters company because the deal didn't come off in the end. No, absolutely right. Well, we've shot mention it. Um, yeah. But I mean, you mentioned um, um, your leg. I think that that's the most obvious injury from the images that everyone's seen. Uh, you mentioned that wasn't the biggest concern. It was the organs and, you yeah. know, because they didn't stop and you did. But I mean, um, I mean, it was, I use the term, it was smashed to bits, wasn't it? Your leg, it, it was yeah. absolutely, I mean, it's, and and you've had it re-put back together with pins and plates and God knows what else. Um, it's just an amazing job that they well, did. I mean, it, <laughs> when I had the accident, obviously, said to me, you know, bones will always heal. But it was the, the internal bits, you have, they, they sometimes don't come back. And because there was the, 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 
I can stand on my left leg and and I can feel the pressure I'm putting on that left leg because my legs swell up so much that I actually crush the nerves in my leg. So over the years now, I've got her back on my upper thigh and a little bit down towards my calf at the back, but everything else, my foot, my leg, my is numb. So they had to, they had to uh, well, um, fuse my ankle because you have a drop foot. So my ankle now doesn't bend. I, my toes are all curled in it like that, like a claw, because the nerve doesn't work. And that creates its own problems. But you know, I still say I'm still cracking my son Stephen in a, in a Lotus uh, uh, Elise car. Um, and you learn to cope. Your body learns to cope in, in, in different ways. You know, the speed's still there, then you learn to, to cope differently. Um, and because of the break in the leg and all the fractures, my left leg is an inch and a half shorter than my right leg. Right. So oh. I suppose we're build up on the shoe. But every 2,000 steps, when I hip hitch, my brain doesn't tell my left leg to pick itself up. And I trip, my left leg trips. Uh, left right. Leg trips up. And then I had that in bars where I said, I could be in an airport or in a supermarket. So I said, just watch that step there, right? Just to hide it through comedy. Bit like Chandler out of Friends. You know, you always <laughs> try and hide your embarrassment uh, that way. Uh, because if I wore a build up shoe, everybody looks at you and say, oh, why has he got that on? And then kids, so I just leave it. And I've had specialists tell me, because I hip pitch, I'm wearing at the joints on my back, uh, that when I get older in life, those that will come to fruition. But I have to say, touch wood, I go to bed each night with no pain in my back. Brilliant. Uh, I have a little bit of pain in my hip because I got a rod down there after my second accident, which I was doing a bike ride for charity. Uh, yeah, I was going to come up. To, yeah. <laughs> that's the only time you ever put metal into it. Wow. I mean, that's incredible. Amazing. Then, I, mean, I was in the hospital in Whitechapel. I burst an artery uh, in my, in my uh, left femur. And Ooh. because I, my leg was in traction with uh, external pins, I couldn't move the leg. And they couldn't move me in the bed. So I had bed sores my back of my head and my elbows and my, top, my bottom, back of my heels. Because oh. there's earth bed. And you imagine lying there from September, October, November, December, January, February. For five months on your back and not moving. Oh. Yeah, mm. Nobody got, got sores. But I was going to come to a story there for you. Mm. What was it then? You saying about... Um, well, oh, well, yeah. Like, yeah. So I burst this femur. Yes. Like, so because the leg was in traction, they couldn't move the leg. So <sighs> when all that stuff inside your inside around the muscle, it dried like um like a glue. So the right. reason why I, I limp and hip pitch is because when you bend your leg, your femur, your your muscle slides up and down on your femur. Right. right? Like it's a two in one action. Because my left muscle is stuck to the femur i can't bend the leg the kneecap's fine is that muscle is, is stuck to the femur and twice now two operations done they're called quadplasties where they put your general circuit and a aesthetic and they go in and it's like salami they slide the muscle off and slices off your of your muscle and then you've got to start bending your leg again and twice i tore the skin across the kneecap and twice they put it back into plaster in case I picked up infections, and then again, the time you got the plaster off, the muscle stuck back down again oh, on your femur. Yes. And now that whole left leg, it feels like wood because there's so much what you call scar tissue in there now, and that's it. End of that, that's how it is. God, goodness me, that's incredible. F1, the final nail in the coffin, instead of push, pushing, was out in his death in May the 1st. 1984. I was just going to say, because you were very close to it and you yeah. raced him a lot. And big time world champion, the world at his feet. He was a god. He was doing a lover charity in, in Brazil. Mm. You know, and he's got no one to leave that to. You know, he's got like that legacy. You know, yeah. a bit like Michael Schumacher and Mick Schumacher. Yeah. I still have a life inside motorsport. Motorsport is the most part of my life. Um, and it always will be. And any chance I get a drive or do a track day, I'm in there. Yeah. Uh, but there's no one appreciates being above the soil than myself. My dad used to always sure. say, he used to say, it's a grand day to be above the soil. It was a long time ago. There you go. 
That's a great saying. And, and, and of course, you were close to Ayrton when he died. I think you probably yeah. thought that is... That was a, that, no that, need. The, the final nail in the cover. Yeah, let, there's like no need to go back almost. Let the F1 go. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. I mean, one of, I mean, just to fast forward, I mean, you did get back into, you know, what many regard the top UK racing series. Just fast forwarding, what was it, 25 years on from um, Jerez, you uh, had an outing in the British Touring Car Championship at Thruxton, just down the road from me here, yeah, yeah. Um, in the Infinity. Um, just very quickly, how did all that come about? Because there's a lot of BTCC fans following the page. And uh, how did it all come about? Because it was Richard Walker and... Uh, no, sorry, Richard Walker. Um, Keith, Richard Walker Clark, and Derek Barr and all those guys. I was driver coaching a young lad, Matthias Tusker, in the Palmer's F2 series. And like uh, another young guy from, from Germany. And we were doing quite well. We got, I think, three lockouts on the front row of the grid. And this uh, guy got involved with Infinity, the company at the time. And there's a whole new team set up that year for BTCC. And I think the, I think Infinity gave them uh, two, if not four chassis and a bit of money, about 600 grand, which they didn't spend. And they didn't do hardly any testing. So the time we got to Thruxton, um, that was my first time with the car. So they go out and learn Thruxton in a left-hand drive British touring car, get used to all the do's and don'ts. Uh, and then back then, the 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 people that supplied the, the steering pump for the, for the power steering kept packing up. And I packed up in one of the sessions and I couldn't get the car straight enough and just tipped the barrier and broke the bottom of the track rod and then I got a spare one. So I missed the next session. Right. But I said to the team for the last session, for the last race, because each, each race was a test session. I said, just go, I said, max on the <laughs> rear dampers because I said the whole car round the complex and chicane were as quick as anybody. Round Kempton were quick, but round Goodwood and Church it was like a kangaroo. It was just crossing, the back. bouncing. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we step the damping, I'll be fine. So like a second and a half. I said, this car is massively under damped, right? I went then and rang um, Christian Horner, because I know Christian quite well. I said, look, can we come along and use your shaker rig? He said, yes, you can, because they're also uh, sponsored by Infinity at the time. And I went to a guy called Sean, to Pierre Monsieur, who lived in Zurich. He met the main man from Nissan Europe, because they lived in Zurich as well, on that Tuesday. Now, in less than 48 hours, I had a deal done on the sugar rig for the dampers for the car. And Sean um, Pierre was putting in 200 grand into the, into the team. If we could take a team back, to bounce and run ourselves. Anything we find, we share with the modern day team. Um, and because Nissan were spending so much money, most especially Le Mans, remember the car they had the three wheel project, the car that the, the two wheels in the back and one in the front, they were spending huge money. They just put the plug in on motorsport. And that was it done. And then what happens? Long comes I Sutton, long comes BMR, what it is. They get the car, get the dumping sword out. Hey, presto, they're at the front of the grid. What do I know? <laughs> <laughs> I it, it's it. all down to you. Yes. Well, party down to me, but yeah, yeah I was a lot more work in the car after that. I had a bit of a chat, a few messages with um, um, Aidan Moffat. Excuse okay. me, Aidan Moffat. Yes. Uh, obviously, the touring car driver. Um, and he said that he actually got the two cars, um, or two of the cars that you and... The Richard sun. Go on, yes. But you drive them, and you basically bought them because they thought, oh, they're going to be like a little bit of fun, you know, track days up at Knock Hill and race them around a bit. And obviously, on the back of what you had done, he, it was him who basically said, "We need to get a new, we need to get new ones of these." <laughs> and they basically went on and and did what they did. And won the British Car Championship two years back to back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There you go. What to say, you know. I but was it a good experience for you behind the wheel when you were in the for that I tip, weekend? I tip my hat off to Ash because I'm not the driver. Ash is we get behind those touring cars. You watched the races last year, 
uh, of of the what do you call the guy who drove the, the rocket BMW best of uh, Jake Hill. Jake Hill and Ash going through Duffers tip together side by side. Superb, you know, wasn't it? That that's not the car. That's the drivers. Yeah. Uh, you know, I took my hat. Probably the best racing on TV. Great to watch. Even more so, I think, than everyone these days. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. hands down. Hands down, and, more exciting. Yeah. Uh, season starts on TV again. Great. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's coming up very soon. Um, I mean, and obviously, no slight on the other guys who have driven the Infinity, but oh. um, Ash. Top man. He, he can drive anything, that man. He, yeah, he's, yeah. I, th I think he went karting. He hadn't been karting for 20 years. Went out to Le Mans and won. <laughs> it was like, as. As I say, you do. like you don't forget those things. You know, if you're quick, you're quick. It's just yeah. an F1, you're only as good as the car that they can give you. I mean, you can't go out and buy, say, a Ferrari tub, put a Mercedes into it, and a, and a Williams gearbox. Yeah. It's like a cake, you know. If one of the ingredients is missing from a cake, it won't rise. If one of the ingredients is missing from one of the F1 car, you're not quick. No. Uh, you know, a lot of teams got the same engines. Same gearbox, same suspension as does the Aston Martin, and I wouldn't surprise me in the next few races that the back end of that the Mercedes of one car, AirPods or sidepod wise looks very exactly the same as an Aston because they just need more downforce and grip. And the way they're going to get that is get that rear diffuser working better and sucking the air of the car better. Mm -hmm. And then they'll be off. Inside information. And they'll be off. There you go. Yes. <laughs> you didn't hear that. <clears throat> Things in ears, everyone. Yeah, get the book. <laughs> um, just very quickly. I mean, just moving on. I'm just conscious of the time. Um, moving on from that. I mean, you've you've done various races. You know, you said you can still go up against your son and race mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. You've been involved with like Comtech as a driver coach and uh, and all the bits and pieces there. Um, it's all going. So going pretty, and you set up the Donnelly track um, yep. experiences with Lotus and all that kind of thing. DonnellyTrackAcademy.com. I do afternoon talks. I speak a lot slower. I press my vials. And, you know, it's a bit of history there of what I've done. So we good pictures to look at at the same time. Um, I, do, I was keeping in contact. We won the World Series by Renner in our first year. We had a guy there called Alex Danielson. Quick kid. We had pretty tough. The main thing we did was show him that your breaking point never changes. It's always, you come to the numbers. Yes, you carry a bit more speed in, you always break the same point. And he's going in too quick, not under control, and coming out too slow. Once you've got that inside and show him in the, in the data graphs, he even got, got pulled the next three races in the trot and won the championship. You know, great. Mm -hmm. But it's not always just down to the driver. You know, other things, you know, you got to show the driver what they're doing wrong, but they realise, oh yeah, what you're saying is right. They accept that for granted. A young guy, that guy, young guy Tusker in F2. He was 16 and then the national license. And he went to the last race in Monza with a chance to win the championship. You know, great kid because you know previous. So he didn't realize, you know, he didn't do any F3. If I said, drive that car to that wall flat, he wouldn't do it. And he came out and he won races and got quicker and quicker. And he won International Driver of the Year. At the Oscar Awards that year, beat all the guys from F2, F, uh, from F2, from F2, and F3. Great kid. Wow, yeah. wow. terrific. Um, something has just sprung into my mind. I had saw something earlier on. Um, forgive me if you're watching, but there's a chap called Ed who was involved with Mazda when you were at Le Mans with Kenny Atchison and those guys, and the, the car just broke down because he didn't put any oil in it or something. Um, and he said, I had to uh, mention that. I do apologise. The guy's called Ed and I've forgotten his surname, but he uh, mentioned that I have to mention that to you. And he said that he can just remember having Kenny in his ear saying, I've got no fucking drive, <laughs> that kind of thing. I was in Mexico doing F1. And we did we did them all the year before that with Julian Bailey and Mark Bundell. Well, the old straight was, there's no chicanes. My fastest speed ever in a race car was Thursday night, you turn the turbo up, the turbo is like the cooler, down through that public road, through a forest, 243 miles an hour in the dark. We were clocked up. The fastest car that year was a Mercedes at 250. That's the member it flipped with Don Breck and Weber. In the then woods, yeah. Against yeah. it, hindsight. So then we came back to drive for this in the next year, teammate to Kenny, who came across from Mercedes. 
I think, don't quote me, it might have been Olivia Gree or Patrick Tommy or something like that. And after you've done your qualifying, for those races, 24 hours, it's a brand new car. So you put four new suspension corners onto it, new gearbox, which has been new parts, new engine. So the car's got all new parts on it for the start of the race, for 24 hours. And I think we qualified in the top 10. I think Mark was on pole by nearly six seconds because the engine over boosted and then all the Japanese came on down telling him to stop the engine, but he kept going and stuck on pole by about six seconds. So no weren't low nerves one speed, he was doing down the Moosel on straight. And anyway, pace car comes in, goes out to get his round for the start. Everybody's getting the tires warmed up. And they all come past the, the, the pit gantry and there's no Kenny. And as you rightly say, Kenny come on the radio and says, Look, say guys, I pulled off the Porsche cars. <coughs> he says I've got gears, but no drive. You, and you put it on two blocks in the car, so you can go out there and help f- fix the car. So, or Team Merrill go out and assist you in how to fix the car, okay? But you can't walk more than X number of metres away from the car, otherwise you're declassified. Right. And anyway, free back comb was an airport next to the morning, free back comb, and it turns out a brand new pinion in the gearbox broke on the green flag lamp. Oh. They still pay me my 100 grand. Uh, for a good for, for doing because it wasn't my fault. I flew back from Mexico and uh, I was ordered to, to, to do the gig. It was my fault. And fair play to them. They, they paid the money up front. Thank you very much. Fair play to them indeed. So, there's a chap called Ed Taylor. I just had a quick look. I don't know if you remember a guy called Ed, Ed Taylor, but you said he was with, yeah. Um, but yeah, <laughs> all, all that effort for the. I'm all heart, things. I'm all heartbroken, yeah. Oh, crikey. Um, okay. Wow. Wow. I mean, uh, I've just. I mean, <laughs> There's so many things we could talk about here, but I'm going to sort of wind it down. We've got some fun questions here that I always try and end with. There's a couple that are coming at the side here. Firstly, Chris McMahon. Firstly, how did it feel to be reacquainted with the 102 again at Goodwood? Um, said you had a drive there. I did. I drove the what was what was Derek Spur car then. Um, anxious, not because I was afraid of it, because as we've been well documented. I don't actually remember the action. I don't remember the board of the action where I signed a new contract for 5.6 million. I was going to get a driver. <clears throat> I was going to get a Lewis Carlton. Free clothes from Hugo Boss. Chicks were were keen. You know, doesn't get any better than that, does it? You know, it Happy like, days. Like rock and roll lifestyle. I was a new Mick Jagger. You know, it was great. Didn't last very long, of course. And um, so that was something special because um to be there to get the attention to sign the autographs um and to get the sound was was unique unfortunately the guy that owned the car at the time he went out and did the second run and um put the, put the clutch out on it and be the lambo v12 the team didn't have a spur clutch so there it's after the rest of the weekend uh on display and that wasn't the purpose of the exercise but I got into it. Managed to get, get into the original overalls I was wearing and the, and the helmet. Not many drivers could do that. Yeah. Staying in yeah. shape. It's all good. Yeah. <laughs> Not now. Um, it is. <laughs> nah, <it's me. laughs> nah, terrific. Um, I mean, I'm I'm glad you mentioned the sound because I was at qualifying for the 1990 British Grand Prix and I always maintain it was the best sounding car. Oh, definitely. No oh. Beat the Ferrari, beat the... It the, should be like... It should be like a mobile phone ringtone. It should it just oh. you could you could stand and not even open your eyes, hear that car coming, you say, That's a Lambo coming. There's a team there there oh, uh, with Eric Bernard and Eric Cummins, uh the Roos. Yeah, the yeah, Lola La Russe, yeah. So you you four and track it at the same time. Great sound. But as I said, wouldn't pull the skin of a rice pudding. No. <laughs> yeah, all 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 show and no go, isn't it? Or something like that. Like. All whistles and no bells. <laughs> but they didn't know the time. They, they were busy. They, being the minds of losing time, were trying to keep the team going. I agree with Derek Racing at um, at Jerez, you know, to try and prove the sponsor they're going to go forward, get a more powerful engine. It's just um, uh, trying to survive, you know. And as, as Ron Dillis said to a Germany came into F1, Welcome to the Piranha Club. But then eventually they lost the camel money to Williams and to Benetton. Yeah. And that was the demise of, of well, to, I'm proud to say that myself, Derek Warwick and Johnny Herbert 
with the last three official Chapman drivers in F1. It is. That's a, that's a lovely thing to have, isn't it? Yeah. yeah you know, the guy had Senna, Jimmy Clark, uh, Graham Hill. Jochen Rint was. Jochen Rint, Jackie Hicks. Great guys <sighs> the years, you know. Great. And wow. Many more just, I just can't, didn't come to mind. That's some great company to be keeping. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Terrific. Um, I've just seen a question from uh, Kay Baker. And this is, uh, I was going to talk about the Rat Pack guys. We've mentioned them earlier. Um, brilliant bunch. He says, what's your funniest story in motorsport? Or your, I guess your funniest moment. Um, I guess it might involve some of the Rat Pack. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> Ben is on, on live on there. Um, <laughs> I'll, I, I will take any flack that comes. It's fine. <laughs> funniest. <laughs> Well, it wasn't funny at the time. I, I could t tell you the, probably one of the most upsetting, disappointing things in in, in world sports. You know, I landed a, a contract for F1, and I realised from my days at at um, Paul Ricard driving the Arrows that I wasn't fit enough. And we went to a test at Estrel, which was quite a physical circuit, and I still then wasn't fit enough. So in the gym, and you were constantly watching your diet, doing the extra, converting your helmet to do, strengthen your neck muscles up. And so you pushed me, and I got down to, I think I got down to 67 kilos in weight, uh, which is no mean feat for it, so it's five foot 10. And strong, and I thought it was fit. Got to Phoenix, Arizona, first Grand Prix for uh, Lotus. Um, very, very proud, feeling very humble, a uh, little bit too shy, too shy. And we came to qualifying. Derek's suspension, rear suspension broke off. They weren't going to let me quite qualify. So like, I'll sign any indemnity, just give me one lap, because the qualifying tires were one lap, which I got in. And I think I qualified. You look at my records, 19th, so I got towards the back. Nothing special. We made the race. And you know at the start of a race, they do two or three laps to the grid. So you go through the pit lane, get used to the set of the car, on the grid, you get out, sit and drink your water, and the team does a bit of piece of the car. Not what they like to do they, but there are blankets and laptops. Yeah. And I got back into the car, get a finger for them to start the engine, murder, turned over, turned over, we can catch, fuel pumps on, fuel pumps off. Run with the fuel pump, try the fuel pump, and eventually the, the ring in the side of the gearbox, the shaft, it went ping and broke off, right? Oh. So the guy said, Look, let them all go, Marty, and we'll jump start you on the on the on the grid. So they've all left, of course, they left the grid, and I've been pushed on it and brrr, brrr, we to start pushing the pit lane. And for my first Grand Prix, the engine wouldn't start. You'd go all the way across the other side of the world, you spent four, five, six months in a gym training and for not to start the race, trust me, there's no feeling like in the world of disappointment and frustration. You know? It's a bit heartbreaking. I mean, oh, yeah, big time. And it's yeah. not like it's a, like a short hop to the east coast of the States. Well, it's the... well like going to, to Italy or France or to, to do a test or a race. You don't know <sighs> the other side of the world, you know, on the west coast of America. Jeez, that What's... must have been dreadful. I can only imagine how gutted it must have been. Mm. Um, oh, crikey. But no, thank you, Kay, for the question. Thank you, Kay. Um, right, very quickly. I mean, uh, fun questions. I always ask these at the end just to wrap things up. It's been nearly two hours. It's absolutely flown by yet again. Um, did you have any favourite drivers growing up? Did you? Because, uh, I mean, you said your mind wasn't on racing in F1, but did you have any favourite drivers that you were? Well, you, you, can't, you can't have ignore in my era that I grew up, you know, I started to race or an for a bit of fun. I heard and arrived to in England, committed, he was married to a very young, wealthy lady. And Angie Furman let them have one of her houses. Uh, and she hated the fact that she had no house servants. She had to cook for herself or get takeaways. Didn't like the English weather. It was always like this January time. It's cold and miserable. There's no tropics. And at the end of the year, I heard one of the European and British championships, they went back to Brazil. Ralph couldn't get, get right, I heard him to come back for the for, for festival. So he gave Tommy Byrne the drive, and that really right. lost Tommy's career again. 
Um, so I look up there and he made the equipment that, you know, he came back. He said, I like racing cars. I'm good at that. And that's what I do. And he left and met the wife behind and came back to Europe. Eventually, they divorced. So that wasn't a very good business decision from her end of things. But he <laughs> <laughs> No. No. Uh, and then European, British European champion, F3 champion, straight into F1. He had offers from, from Williams and other F1 teams. But he knew he wasn't ready in his mind for F1. Yes, he could drive the cars quickly, but he needed to do his schooling. You can't go primary school and secondary school and go straight to university. Yeah. You've got to learn to run. You've got to learn to walk before you can run. Yeah. So Eric went to Tolman, who are new in the F1, learned his trade with them, and obviously proved quite a few times that he was quick. He it was a Monaco off. race, wasn't it? It was. Yeah. And then the offer started to come to to um, to Jordan, and then he went to Lotus again. And then when he knew the time was right, joined the big boys like McLaren and like like Williams, you know. And he just had that air of confidence. He knew to him to finish second, you were the first loser, you know. That's why him and Martin Brunner had so many acts. Or be so many accidents together. Well, the, um, like the Ocean Park one that we all know about. <laughs> then we went yeah. to and Lando Martin's car. Ocean yeah. Park, exactly the same. You know, he didn't want um, to, to be uh, second best. But again, EJ did a very crafty move. Went to Italy, got the agents on an exclusive deal. Earn found out behind closed doors. Went to Italy, they said no, and beat them again. And eventually they gave in and gave them the dimensions that Martin had. And came back, picked up, and started winning again. Yeah. So obviously, Edson was, it was just the way he did things as well, wasn't it? On, on and off track. It was. That, uh, I know or know about him, that, that presence, you know, I can say for many, he was in 404 1600. The young lad, you look at pictures of Edson, was in from 81 to 82 to Ayrton Senna in the 90s, how much he had matured and developed as a sportsman, you know. And I think, I think, um, first time will tell you himself, you know, motor racing, you never ever stop learning. It's a learning yeah. progress. They've got newer cars this year, newer cars last year. The FI change the regulations as a never ending process. Yeah, yeah, amazing, terrific. I mean, I mean, there's so many people I've had on here that have said that said the similar thing about it and just how he was who he was how he went about things you know uh, um uh, uh, alex caffey said he was the only guy who came to speak to him you know in in f1 and just things like that which is which is lovely i've actually got a picture of that up there i don't know if you can see that yeah present from my wife um okay yeah it's wonderful um f1 aside was there anything that you would have liked to have tried i mean obviously you'd have loved to stay in f1 for longer if yeah, things had sure. panned out but was there anything like, I don't know, IndyCar or NASCAR or anything like that that you would have loved to have a crack at? I have to say, Give never been tickled my fancy. I went to the Indy 500 for my 50th birthday. It was a birthday present. And I know some of the drivers there from, from the years that have been raised in the UK. And yes, it's one of the world's biggest one-day spectacles. Fantastic. Yeah, it's awesome. But, I, I actually but, went last year. It was great. Only the last quarter of the race, they started to turn the wick up and uh, started to sort of put more juice in the engines, started to get them on the same, uh, same uh, race lap. It's only then that the, sort of the horns come out and people then start to run side by side through the corners because yeah. every other lap is money in their pocket and you're not going to race when the race on the the 50th lap or the 100th lap. Or the, the, it's, it's a 500 mile race. So that yeah. way, that got hospitality, got some good uh, bourbon and bourbon and cook. You know, it could be quite, could be quite boring at the times. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I found that the bit in the middle is like, oh, yeah, yeah, but still yeah. great, still great. Well, no, anything else? No, definitely wasn't. No, now as I sit here talking to you, I would love to go out to Australia and try and have a go at um, the Aussie V8s. Yes, series, great, they're great people, great characters. Bathurst Start and all great. that. Sound great down that Conroe Street and Mount Panorama, you know, yeah. that's on my bucket list. And trust me, within the next two years, I'll do that. 
Well, if you need anyone to go with you. <laughs> Carry my other bag for me. Yeah. Happy days. I'll do that. No problem. Um, yeah, I'd love to go. I'd love to go. I'm a big, big fan of the series. Um, okay, here we go. Uh, okay, three more. The favourite circuit you've ever raced on? Has to be Brantas Grand Prix for me. Because yes. I have a track record there, second to none. I never lost in any races there in F3, 3000, and Lotus Cup UK, Rudris Mini Cars. I lost one race because of my gammy leg. I missed a shift from second to third out of the 30s onto the back straight. Right. I lost the momentum when a guy called uh, Craig Denman got alongside me. Now I thought I can run side by side with him going through Hawthorns. But this is a, a gentleman series, it's not a career move. And Something inside me made me lift off. I didn't pass without eating grass. And as we came around, we faced the team was delighted. I was disappointed because I lost my track record of never being beaten there. So, Bans has definitely Grand Prix track. Spa has that special ambience about the challenge of some of the corners flowing and speed. It's a great place to be. Um, and I loved, where else did I love? I love Suzuka when I was there racing from a Nippon for a while. One of A. Jordan's deals. Marty, where's the check? That's what he wanted. So I was last in and first out. I'll tell you a story though. Myself and a good guy mentioned about Kenny Atchison. Went over to Japan and we we worked on a works team. The works team's got the Dunlops, Bridgestones and and what got me another uh, Yoga Hammers, right? Oh the Yoga Hammers, yeah. Ross Cheever, Eddie Cheever stunned was quick to look at that. Or the Dunlops. But we were we weren't very pinnacles for a team. And these guys were great because every time they came back or they got a, a new electric fuel system in the car. Yeah, and they, they tried the best they could, but there was a guy there who just went and qualified. He's by 42. And he made qualified by seven less, he by about two seconds. And we said to him, just get us the tires, he's qualifying them. And he said, No, but you have to see that. I said, it's not the same tire. It can't be, because within about 12 laps, we're looking to get past this guy. And we're qualifying 21st to 26 on the grid. You know, it was embarrassing. Because in Japan you get introduced to the crowd from the reverse grid side of things and they throw cigarettes and gifts into the crowd. So I used to fly in the Thursday, test the Friday. I organized, well no, I said Kenny organized with me that if you if you did certain many certain number of lap, laps in Suzuka, you missed the flight out that night from Narita, right? Right. You had to stay that night, fly the next day from uh Narita to Anchorage in Alaska, which is a long time that's going direct. Stephen Hart, then they defrost the plane with a, with a liquid and they had to fly from Alaska to England, right? Crikey. <laughs> so you're, it's a two-day travel instead of one-day travel in the air. So we deliberately crashed into each other. He'd spin right, spin right, hit him, and he'd hit me. You run back and get it back, back, back to the pits, get chains, the team will give you a check, taxi waiting, get to the bullet train, bullet train to the, the, the airport, on the plane, fly out there, done and dusted. It's terrible. But we knew we had no chance of winning the races. I was getting paid anyway. EJ was getting paid. So we like last in, first out, and staged the race, making sure we had an accident. So we didn't do more than 12 hours. So we make sure we got a fight out of there. That's how bad it was. That's brilliant. Brilliant. Oh, we need to have a crash, take the money and get out. <laughs> EJ, there's your check. You never asked, how'd you go in the race? Never. How was it? Just there's your check. Where's the money? Yeah. Show me the money. Yeah. Fantastic. Oh, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. <laughs> um, okay, this is the tough question. I ask this for everyone at the end. No one can ever really answer it. I mean, yeah. I've yeah. Got, a, got a list here. Just some of the races that you've raced against. I mean, this could be a long time, but obviously the guys in the Rat Pack that we know about, you've raced against Roberto Moreno, you've got Ratzenberger, Anthony Reid, Pirro, uh, Bob Wallet. God bless him. Yeah. Tiffany yeah. Doe, Leto. Wallace, Alan McNish, Eddie Irvine, Paul and Derek Warwick, of course, Alan Menu, Gerhard Berger, Resigant Patrese, Alacy, Alberetto, Mansell, Boots, and PK Prost, Senna, etc., etc. Um, I mean, that's a good company to be racing okay. against. Um, is is there anyone, I, I guess maybe Ayrton, but is there anyone else apart from that who stands out as being a hell of a competitor or someone yeah, that you think... With horse cars... UK, uh, Richard Lloyd, basically. Oh, yeah. And I raced uh, his Porsche with uh, 
bar, I forgot his name. Excuse me. Uh, but with Derek Bell at Spa. Okay. Uh, that race and we qualify, you know, somewhere mid mid grid. And I looked up to uh, Derek because, you know, back in the day, he was no slouch in those work Porsches. To be, to be as successful as he was at Le Mans, you know, you just, you just don't get lucky. That's experience. And I raced with him. It's a great privilege to to say I've done that. Um, I got in the car and going forward in the, in the wet at Spa, I passed all the Castrol Jaguars. It was going well. It was catching up to the uh, Mercedes Group C cars. And then we came in to hand over to Derek. He got the car for the last stint. And I think in about 15 laps or so, the engine went on the car. That was a great shame. But you know, those those races, I know there's no success attached to them. The fact you, you're you racing and a teammate to the great Derek Bell, you, you, money doesn't buy that, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I love that answer. That's, I think you're the first person who said Derek Bell, which is very surprising because um, yeah, he's just a legend, isn't he? I mean, he's... Yeah. And I'll I give you the time of the day. If he's got time, he's not on the... Be uh, somewhere at certain time. He's always at uh, Goodwood. If he's got to be somewhere and he can't talk to you, then fine. But if he can, he will. Great guy. Lovely. Love that. Um, right. Well, I mean, it's been over two hours, which I can't believe because it's absolutely hurtled by, but it's been. Um, um, uh, open here, I think. Sorry? <laughs> the bar is still open here, I think, somewhere. Right. Yeah. We'll let you get in down there. Right. <laughs> But uh, firstly, thank you to everyone who's tuned in. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you for all the questions. I hope we've covered them all. Um, and Martin, it's been an absolute joy speaking with you. Thank you so much for coming on. It was great to meet you briefly at Autosport. I'm sorry for grabbing you. No um, but thank well, you so much for coming on. pleasure of speaking about my specialised subject, which is myself. I want to thank <laughs> my family. I want to thank, thank Liz. Hopefully she's listening tonight. Uh, and my friends that are working at Polestar. Hopefully they don't need international translator but hey ho you, you get what you pay for <laughs> fantastic that's no, brilliant i mean uh no thank you so much for coming on absolutely superb um and hope we can catch up again in the future somewhere be um, great. that'd be brilliant thank hopefully you very much everyone sorry i said hopefully it won't be another another 20 years <laughs> well hopefully yes it won't be uh quite that long but um no thank you very much everyone for tuning in martin thank you so much for uh, your time and uh, we'll be back very soon uh with another chat thanks very much guys good night <laughs>